Uh, good morning, folks. Um, Jeff Robbins, chair of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. We are letting people into the meeting. Um, so we're going to let the uh, Zoom populate here for the next minute or so, and then we'll get started. All right, it looks like we have populated up to 81 participants and it doesn't look like others are trying to populate. So I think we are ready to roll this morning. Um, uh, Wednesday, the August 26th, the third day of Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation rulemaking on mission change. Um, Ms. Larson, um, can we have the roll call? Yes, Commissioner Gibbs. Here. Commissioner Gonzalez. Here. Commissioner McGowan. Here. Commissioner Mesner. Here. Commissioner Nanjapa. Here. Commissioner Putnam. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Robbins. Here. Mr. Chair, you have seven out of seven uh, commissioners present. Fantastic. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, excited to see our participants with us. It looks like we have 88 parties uh, on the Zoom call. Uh, we are moving into the third day of mission change rulemaking. We are debating and hearing testimony on the 300 series rules, that is the rules around permitting. Um, had a lot of great testimony yesterday and uh, anticipate uh, the same today. Um, we're following the procedures as laid out in our case management order um, and we have an agenda that can be found online. Um, if you go to our COGCC webpage, you can find the agenda. Uh, also, from a procedural perspective, um, each day's uh, vi video recordings is uh, visible the following day on our website by going to our website and then clicking over to our YouTube channel. So if you missed the exciting events of yesterday, you can go back and, 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 and relive that uh, through the YouTube channel um, on your own time. Um, with that, uh, Ms. Larson, I believe we're moving directly into additional party presentations. Uh, from my agenda, I believe we have four parties that are the next panel, that is Battlement Concerned Citizens, Conservation Colorado, Western Colorado Alliance, and Grand Valley Citizens Alliance. Uh, do I have that right, Ms. Larson? You do indeed. And they have how much time? Uh, they have requested to use 40 minutes for the 300 series. 40 minutes. Okay. Yes. I, my minutes pieces is, has been completely wrong every time, but okay, so 40 minutes for them. Um, so they'll have 40 minutes to present their testimony. Um, for all parties that are involved, um, we ask parties to file pre-filed written testimony, um, which they did, uh, which allows the commissioners to read the testimony ahead of time and now the parties will have this 40 minutes to uh, you know hone in on the areas of the testimony for the 300 series following presentation um, what we do is commissioners then have the ability to ask questions of the party's witnesses um, and then um, we move to the next panel so with that uh, it looks like we have allowed into the panel um, the witnesses as well as their attorneys, um, who, whomever is going to start off and uh, with this panel, if you could unmute yourself and then I will be able to note that you are the leader, at least in getting it started. And it looks like that's Mr. Matt Sura. And, uh, so and Matt, Mr. Chair, I, I apologize for interrupting, but Mr. Sura, is Ms. Robinson going to be part of this panel? She's, uh, she's going to be speaking at the 500 series. I apologize for that. Not a problem. Thank you. Okay, so we don't have her for this series. That's correct. Okay, uh, Mr. Sura, you have the floor. Okay, well, I'm gonna uh, try to share my screen and it says that I'm disabled from doing that. Okay, give us a sec. Um, we'll enable you to share screen. There you go, you should have the ability now. And I do. Excellent.
Okay, well, thank you. Um, my name is Matt Sura, and I and Matt Samuelson are representing Battlement Concerned Citizens, Conservation Colorado, Grand Valley Citizens Alliance, and Western Colorado Alliance. We want to formally welcome you to your positions on the Colorado and Gas Conservation Commission. We believe that having a professional commission was an important part of Senate Bill 181. We also want to thank the staff who have been working for months to get us to this point. Time is limited to talk about all we support in these regulations, but briefly, the organizations support the concept of oil and gas development plan, increased notice requirements, uh, required consultation with schools and water providers, increased time for public comment, and comprehensive area plans. The issues we want to raise in this presentation include independent dual authority of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and local governments, cumulative impact analysis, alternative location analysis, uh, disproportionately impacted communities and water reduction plan. Now we're going to hear from Dave Devaney and Betsy Leonard about their experience in Battlement Mesa, Colorado that it addresses nearly all these issues. Good morning, my name is Dave Devaney and until very recently I lived in the beautiful residential community of Battlement Mesa, at one time advertised as the Colorado dream. In 2009, when a natural gas operator announced plans to drill 200 wells on 10 well pads inside my community's borders, a group of residents created a community watchdog group called Battlement Concerned Citizens. I have, been, I have served as the chair or co-chair for about 11 years. During those years, our group has been very active in the battle to keep the oil and gas industry from bringing their industrial operations into not only Battlement Mesa, but to any other community in Colorado. Sadly, we have been disappointed time and again by the people that we felt should be helping us, namely the COGCC, the CDPHE, and particularly the Garfield County Commissioners. But now we have hope. With the passage of Senate Bill 119-181 and the rulemaking that is now taking place. If the spirit of that legislation is maintained, all Colorado residents will benefit. Just to orient you, this is a map of the oil and gas basins in Colorado. Battlement Mesa is in Garfield County in the Peons Basin on the left side of the screen. A closer look at Garfield County shows that there are numerous directional wells depicted in purple that have been drilled over the past 20 years. Currently, there are more than 11,000 active wells in Garfield County. From this Google Earth view, Battlement Mesa is located along the I-70 corridor across the Colorado River from the town of Parachute. And though it is in western Colorado, Battlement Mesa is anything but rural. As a PUD community, there are schools, parks, churches, recreation center, the medical center, shopping plaza, golf course, assisted living center, plus homes and apartments to accommodate the more than 5,000 people living there. This COGCC map gives a more accurate view of what has been like living in Battlement Mesa for the past 10 years. The wells in purple have been drilled the green wells have been approved but not yet drilled, and the light blue lines in the center, known as the BMCA pad, have not yet been approved. A closer look at Battlement Mesa shows the downhole locations of more than 200 wells that have been drilled within one mile of Battlement Mesa. We know the names of all these pads, but the ones that we will be discussing are the BMCD, B, and A pads. We know these pads well because we have had to live with the noise, odor, traffic, and light pollution as everyone has been leveled, drilled, and hydraulically fractured. This is the BMC D pad as it was being leveled. This is the BMC D pad surrounded by the sound wall. This pad and the B pad were two of the first urban mitigation area wells in the state of Colorado. That means there were less than 1,000 feet from 11 homes or more. Every one of these pads has a history of lights, noise, odor, and citizen complaints. 
Garfield County is very proud of the long list of mitigation measures that have been required for these wells, but please understand a poor oil and gas location cannot be mitigated. Garfield County does not have oil and gas regulations. For almost all of the county, oil and gas development, including waste pits, is a use by right. This meaning that they do not need local government permits. However, Battlement Mesa is a PUD, and as a PUD, it has its own regulations that require a county special use permit for oil and gas development. Before these wells were approved, we repeatedly asked Garfield County and the COGCC to require an alternative lo location analysis. The county refused to request one. URSA claimed that their small drilling rig was only capable of drilling directionally for a short distance, and therefore they had to relocate nearer to homes. Instead of requiring URSA to use a larger drilling rig, like those being used by all other operators in Garfield County, the COGCC allowed URSA to locate two well pads with 52 wells in the middle of my community. Betsy? Good morning. My name is Betsy Leonard, <coughs> and my, <coughs> pardon me, my husband and I have been living in Battlement Mesa for more than 15 years. This has become our retirement home. I started fighting for my health and safety in 2009 when Entero, now URSA, announced they would be drilling for gas within the boundaries of our PUD or planned unit development. There have been phone calls, forums, presentations, letters to the editor, meetings, testimony, petitions, evaluations, and more. Alas, drilling takes priority unless changes are made with the COGCC mission. It has been a struggle to keep our community protections. And frankly, at times, I felt that I was living in an industrial zone. There have been big 18-wheeler trucks, bulldozers, backhoes, dump trucks, and other heavy equipment moving on our residential streets. The mud has been infuriating. The gas company has not been a good neighbor. When digging a pipeline, it caused a fire and a flood, putting our homes at risk. Sometimes the noise was so intense, I could not hear a conversation going on in my driveway. And the smells were terrible, even inside our homes. It caused some of our neighbors to move away. Then there was the light, so intense, shining into my neighbor's bedroom, interrupting sleep. Being an unincorporated community, we petitioned our county commissioners for relief. However, our pleas fell on deaf ears. I have dealt with the Garfield County Commission for years, and they have never been receptive to our concerns. At one session, a commissioner told me that in the voting margin in Battlement Mesa, he had received 75% of the vote, indicating that the remainder 25%, and this is more than a thousand people, did not matter. He felt the need to serve only the people who had voted for him. Furthermore, he told me that I did not represent the people of Battlement Mesa and dismissed my remarks. I was astounded that I had been treated this way by a county commissioner. Dave? Now let me bring your attention to what has been called the worst well pad location in the state of Colorado, the proposed DMC APAD. It is planned to be squeezed into an area bordered by the wastewater and potable water treatment facilities and a 100 foot high, high hillside. 
is proposed less than 500 feet from the Tamarisk Village Mobile Home Park, adjacent to the wastewater treatment facility and less than 1,000 feet from the Colorado River. It is fully, if fully approved by the COGCC, much of a steep embankment will have to be removed to squeeze the well pad into this location. The A pad is a good example of a disproportionately impacted community. URSA initially failed to notify anyone living in the mobile home park about its plans to drill within 500 feet. After they did so, I personally went door to door and talked with many of the closest residents and brought a translator who could speak Spanish. The only people that had been personally notified were those living less than 500 feet from the location. An URSA landman had gone door to door offering a monetary incentive to sign a waiver to the 500 foot buffer requirement. The re residents were told that the drilling was going to happen anyway, so they might as well get paid something. But ultimately, URSA proposed to move some equipment from one side of the well pad to the other side, thereby skirting the 500 foot problem and saving the expense of the waiver payoffs. And finally, the new draft regulations propose a setback of 1,500 feet from 10 homes. I don't agree that there should be a distinction between one home or 10 homes. Every family deserves the same protections. But if the COGCC's proposed setback is used, there will be more than 100 trailer park homes within 1,500 feet of the proposed BMC APAD. Addressing the issue of dual authority of the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and local governments, simply put, there's going to be two permits. There's going to be a Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Com Commission permit and a local government permit in those jurisdictions that choose to regulate. The industry and Garfield County proposal is putting you into an impossible position. First, they're asking for legal deference, asking you to put aside your own mandate to protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. We agree with the analysis of Attorney General Joel Minor. Fr frankly, the statute does not allow you to give them that legal deference. In its pre-hearing statement, Colorado Oil and Gas Association admits that you still have a role to play in being a check on local governments to ensure they, quote, have a reasonable and protective siting process. But what is that? The Garfield County Coalition states that each one of its members developed its own process to review and make siting decisions that support quote, responsible oil and gas development in line with Senate Bill 181. Yet, Delta County does not have oil and gas regulations at all. And we just heard that Garfield County treats oil and gas as a use by right, meaning that it does not need a permit in Garfield County. More importantly, does it meet your mandate to protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment? Which raises the final question. If you get a permit from that has been approved by a local government, what criteria would you use to judge if the location is protective of public health safety, if not through your own permitting process and rules and regulations? You are in the process of defining for the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and our state, the requirements for oil and gas development to meet your mandates within Senate Bill 181. If an operator comes to you with a location and a local government permit, the only way you can judge whether or not it is protective of public health and safety is if it meets your regulations. That is the deference that local government decisions deserve. If an oil and gas proposal meets your regulations, it will likely be approved by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. If a proposal fails to meet your regulations, the operator then needs to go get a variance and make the case to you as to why their proposal meets the requirements of Senate Bill 181. Independent dual authority will work for the industry. It's working right now. To get the certainty and efficiency they need, they will need to find locations and propose oil and gas development that will meet both the state and local, local government standards. Moving to cumulative analysis, we agree with the statements of the affiliated local governments yesterday. Senate Bill 181 requires you to evaluate and address the potential cumulative impacts of every oil and gas development permit. As we saw in the presentation from Betsy and Dave, there are literally more than 200 gas wells within one mile of Battlement Mesa. 
allowing any additional oil and gas development in Battle of Mesa without serious consideration of cumulative impacts is not meeting your mandate. We support the uh, community organization's proposal who are planning to go into this issue in greater detail as the next speakers. Speaking now about alternative location analysis is Becky Roberts from Watkins, Colorado in Arapahoe County. Hello, my name is Becky Roberts. I live in Watkins, Colorado. I haven't had the honor of meeting any of you yet, but all of the volunteer commissioners knew me. In 2018, I spoke at every COGCC hearing from Denver to Fort Collins, from Greeley to Rifle. My story is three years, nine months, and 11 days old. I'll just give you the short reader's digest version today. Since October 2016, our rural community of 62 families called Watkins Farm has fought for an alternative location analysis for the proposed Swan drilling site. Our goal was simply to find a location that would not endanger our neighborhood. So what made the Swan site so dangerous for our community? Its location. The Swan site was for eight wells and 32 tanks directly at the entrance to our subdivision. And there is only one dead end rural road to access our homes. The location of the Swan site would have trapped all 62 families during a well site emergency. Besides your public hearings, we spoke to the Arapahoe Board of County Commissioners, hired an attorney, wrote letters and sent comments to the COGCC. In fact, 175 comments about Swan from nearly every homeowner were submitted during the public comment period. We signed petitions, met with our state senator and representative, spoke with ConocoPhillips and Prosper Farms representatives, and posted a video on YouTube. This is the proposed Swan site. It is in the worst possible location at the entrance to our subdivision and less than a thousand feet from eight homes. We are surrounded on all sides by open space. The land and mineral owner who owns eight square miles of undeveloped land known as Prosper Farms told us they proposed the well pad next to our rural neighborhood because they didn't want to complicate their development plans in the future. During an emergency event at the proposed site, everyone in our community would have to evacuate toward the well site. During a fire, like the one three miles directly south of Watkins Farm this July 4th, or a blowout spewing toxins into the air like in Hudson, Colorado that required a three-day evacuation, or a pipeline fire, or a diesel fire, our entire neighborhood could not evacuate. We would all be trapped. The new rules for alternative location analysis must include clear specific requirements whenever the drilling site is within 2,000 feet of an existing home. This is extremely reasonable since a mile is the average evacuation area in an oil and gas emergency. For over three years, Conoco insisted that there were no alternative locations available. In 2019, following the passage of Senate Bill 181, the COGCC required Conoco to conduct an alternative location analysis for SWAN. However, Conoco refused to consider any legitimate alternatives. The only criteria they used was financial impacts to their bottom line. In response, Watkins Farms attorney and residents proposed 10 different alternative locations. This one showed drilling two and a half mile laterals from existing drilling sites. Alternative two uses three mile laterals from the Prosper Farm drilling site. In 2018, Conoco agreed to use three mile laterals when drilling near the Aurora Highlands future community, but refused to agree to use the same three mile laterals for the Swan site. In numbers three through 10, all our locations in Prosper Farm where the closest home would be 2000 feet away. When the CDPHE twice inspected the proposed SWAN site, they found that a surface use agreement that imposes the impacts from the well site on residents of Watkins Farm is unreasonable. My story does have a happy ending. Following the approval of Senate Bill 181, the COGCC put the SWAN permit on hold. A year later, on March 3rd, 2020, Crestone Peak Resources acquired Conoco's leaseholds in Colorado. And on July 21st, 2020, 
Crestone withdrew the Swan permit because, not surprisingly, they found an alternative drilling location. For over three years, Conoco told Watkins Farm residents there was no alternative site for Swan. It took Crestone just four months to find one. The time and resources my community invested into a bad site does not need to be repeated. The new COGCC rules need to, one, include specific language for alternative location analyses going forward. Two, the new rules need to apply equally to rural communities and urban. And three, all locations should be a minimum of 2,000 feet from any occupied building. With the use of alternative location analysis and appropriate siting, oil and gas development can occur without harming public health and safety. Thank you. Clearly, the alternative location analysis is an important tool to protect against impacts both to public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. On alternative location analysis subject, we respectfully disagree with the staff. The staff's draft does a fair job of identifying those locations that may harm public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. As the draft states, alternative location analysis will be required if you are within a floodplain, within a quarter mile of a public water supply, 2,000 feet of a school facility, less than 500 feet from a home. Less than 500 feet. 1,500 feet from 10 homes, but no analysis of alternative locations are necessary if there are 20, 30, even 40 wells, 20 to 40, 50 tanks proposed 500 feet from nine homes. We're not talking about a setback, merely an analysis to find a more appropriate location. Conflating setbacks with alternative location analysis is a mistake. Operators as the regulated community will follow the regulations. The APAD we heard about was just over 500 feet from homes, so they could be just outside of the setback regulation. The Swan location was just over a thousand feet from homes so they could avoid the urban mitigation area requirements. Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission will attest, the numbers matter. Allowing unlimited number of wells within 500 feet of nine homes means that is exactly what you're going to get. If you're only waiving, you're not only waiving an alternative location analysis, uh, you are also giving the relevant local government citing deference. If passed as written, you will see local governments and local government approved locations with 20 to 30 wells less than 500 to 800 feet um, from 10 or, 10 or less homes. Again, requiring an alternative location analysis anytime an oil and gas location is proposed within 2,000 feet from a home is not a setback. It's merely requiring the operator to show their work. As Occidental and Noble testified yesterday, they already do alternative location analysis as a, as a course of business. Now we'll turn it over to Matt Samuelson. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Matt Samuelson and I'm gonna present several recommendations and red lines to the August 17th staff draft rules pertaining to disproportionately impacted communities. Specifically, we have recommendations on the definition the community engagement plan, and the distance, the distance that initiates an ALA. Um, I'll present these red lines after our witness, uh, Dr. Catherine Dixon from the Colorado School of Public Health explains why environmental justice is an issue with oil and gas development. Thanks everyone. Um, good morning. I'll just get myself set up here. Apologies. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony today. Uh, my name is Catherine Dickinson, and I am an assistant professor of environmental and occupational health at the Colorado School of Public Health. I have a PhD in environmental economics and policy, and my research focuses on the impacts of policy and uh, impacts of policy on environmental and social and health outcomes with a particular focus on the issues of, of environmental justice. I also serve on the advisory board for CDPHE's climate equity framework, which is working to implement, implement 
HB 19-1261 with a specific focus on disproportionately impacted communities. So there's a clear overlap and synergy between that process and the work the COGCC is doing on this topic. Um, in the written testimony that I provided, I presented some of the evidence that my colleagues and I have assembled regarding environmental justice and oil and gas development. Specifically, I defined two main domains of environmental justice that we use. The first is distributive justice, which focuses on how risks and benefits are distributed across groups, while participatory justice focuses on how people are involved and whose voices are heard. Um, I provided evidence that the risks and benefits of oil and gas development are currently not equitably distributed, uh, nor are opportunities to participate in decision-making processes. Uh, the COGCC's proposed rules have the potential to move us closer to these goals. Uh, in today's oral remarks, I'd like to continue to focus on why I believe that environmental justice is at the core of COGCC's revised mission, and also to argue in favor of specific amendments to the proposed rules regarding disproportionately impacted communities. My research team is beginning a National Science Foundation study that will track how SB 181 impacts environmental justice issues uh, in our state. We were motivated to do this work for two main reasons. First, under SB 181, the COGCC's mission, uh, as others have noted, clearly requires that the commission protect public health and safety. As we are well aware in the Colorado School of Public Health, achieving this mission requires understanding and addressing health disparities, meaning that you must identify who is disproportionately impacted and write and enforce rules that protect public health and safety for those communities specifically in order to fulfill the mission of uh, protecting public health and safety. A second motivation for studying the environmental justice impacts of SB 181 concerns the part of the law that gives local communities more say over siting decisions. This provision may increase procedural justice by giving communities, local communities more say in development. However, we are also somewhat worried that if not implemented carefully, local areas with more power and influence may be able to successfully protect their own areas while pushing development onto less privileged, disproportionately impacted communities. Uh, if decisions come down to which community can shout, not in my backyard, the loudest, those without a voice will continue to face higher risks. Uh, the Frontier Academy Bella Romero case is a nationally publicized poster child for this. And to safeguard against more Bella Romero type cases, the COGCC must devise and implement rules that give all communities a real say in decisions that affect them. So with these thoughts in mind, I have some specific recommendations regarding changes to the proposed rules. The first is to provide clear, consistent, and transparent definitions of disproportionately impacted communities. One challenge in this area, which we also face in our research, is the issue of spatial scale. The risks of oil and gas are largest for people living in closest proximity to wells and other infrastructure, for example, within 1,000 or 2,000 feet. Yet the data that are available to identify disproportionately impacted communities are typically data at an aggregate level, for example, census tract or block group characteristics. And these don't tell us specifically who is closest to each well within those areas. So if a large rural census tract is well off overall, but has a small mobile home park or community of color in one area, it may not get flagged as a disproportionately impacted community, yet development could proceed in a way that disproportionately impacts those subgroups. To address this issue, one recommendation is to use the smallest spatial unit possible. Um, currently, as written, the provision identifying areas with a high proportion of people of color uses the census block group, while the low income provision uses the census tract. I would strongly recommend using census block group definition consistently for all of these um, criteria. And furthermore, I echo the recommendation um, that the, uh, the team will be making um, to include mobile home parks or affordable housing units as another criteria for identifying a disproportionately impacted community. Um, second, in, uh, in regards to alternative location analysis, um, there is a need to strengthen community engagement requirements. Rather than a simple description of outreach efforts, the operator should be required at a minimum to provide detailed notes on any concerns raised by the community and how the operator responded to these concerns. So in closing, our society is currently facing a moment of reckoning around systemic racism, oppression, and inequality. Advancing distributive and participatory justice through the COGCC rules and regulations is part of the mandate that's created by SB 181 and is also an opportunity for Colorado to lead the nation towards a more just energy future. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you, Dr. Dickinson. Uh, I am going to attempt to share my screen real quick in order to show some of these 
red lines that we are proposing. And hopefully, can everybody see those? Okay. Um, you know, with the goal of being inclusive and specific, we recommend including mobile home parks like Tamarisk Village of Mobile Home Park that we just heard about uh, and subsidize affordable housing within the definition of a disproportionately impacted community. Staff stated in the draft statement of basis and purpose that they did not accept this suggestion because they feel that the current definition focusing on historically underrepresented populations and lower incomes are likely to include these categories of housing. You know, this may be true, but only if the entire census block group qualified as a disproportionately impacted community. Our objective by including these housing options in the definition is to address situations where a census block group does not qualify as a disproportionately impacted community, but has a mobile home park or subsidized affordable housing within it that would. Furthermore, there are other state agencies that maintain databases on the specific location of these housing options. So the COGCC would not have to create them in order to incorporate this information into its database. We also recommend, there we go. Um, we also recommend including linguistic isolation in the definition. This is a, a US Census Bureau definition and it's used by the Environmental Protection Agency's EJ screen, uh, which is a database that brings together environmental and demographic data to show where low income and minority populations are disproportionately affected by environmental health hazards. Including this variable would account for communities where a non-English language may be predominant. Uh, yesterday, Commissioner McGowan, you touched on this issue, but we recommend requiring a, a community engagement plan with, at a minimum, minimum some best practices for, for hosting the meeting. You know, holding the meeting at a time that's convenient for the community at a location within close proximity to that community, providing interpretive service and childcare if needed, um, and providing written material in the languages spoken by the community. We have also recommended in our pre-hearing statement that a community engagement plan could also be appropriate as a, a form 2A plan submission in Rule 304C. Sorry, I failed to advance the slide. There's that particular. Oh. Um, let's see. In regards to the staff proposal to measure proposed working pad surface from a home, school, or high occupancy unit, we agree with the concept because the point is to protect people within a disproportionately impacted community. You know, a working pad surface is a point on a map, and a disproportionately impacted community is, is going to look like a shape as a census block group. So we need a second point for measurement purposes. However, we think that that distance needs to be at least 2,640 feet. Staff is already contemplating a standalone provision where 2,000 feet from schools would initiate an ALA. But a school within a disproportionately impacted community deserves 2,640 feet if we're going to give actual meaningful substance to defining impacted communities. Plus, we've already seen venue shopping between schools, the aforementioned Frontier Academy and Bella Romero Academy. And these are two schools with vastly different racial and income demographics. And when the siting rules did not differenti differentiate between the communities, uh, the Wellpad site ended up in, with the school that was poorer and had more of minority populations. A 2,640 foot buffer to initiate an ALA is appropriate for home schools and high occupancy units because the impacts to these communities is disproportionately higher than in other communities. This isn't a setback as we heard, it's the it's to initiate an analysis. Furthermore, the distance would not be an outlier. Staff is proposing 2,640 feet as the trigger for an ALA for groundwater wells in a public water system. We think that's the correct distance for those important drinking water wells and for disproportionately impacted communities. I'm gonna pivot real quick and talk a little bit about water. Um, we support the staff's proposal to require a water management plan within a Form 2A application. Combined with proposed rules in the 400 and 900 series, which we'll hear later in the weeks to come, Colorado should get a more complete picture of water use and oil and gas development. However, in the proposed rule also needs to require a wastewater reduction plan in conjunction with the water management plan. Implementing both plans would better account for the input, output, and reuse of water and oil and gas development. Furthermore, increasing the amount of produced water that is reused within oil and gas operations can decrease the amount of fresh water that's used for operations. You know, Colorado is a semi-arid state. 
feels more arid these days. Um, with a booming population, you know, we have more than 5 million people today, but the population is expected to double in 30 years. And the state's water managers are trying to figure out how to accommodate for that growth. Um, in recent years, they've created the Colorado Water Plan to address projected future water needs. Uh, and the state's also created significant resources such as the drought planning toolbox, the Colorado River drought contingency plan, in order to plan to manage its water, prepare for climate change contingencies and for drought conditions. You know, at the moment, the entire state of Colorado is uh, considered to be in a drought. This is three weeks running. Um, much of the state, Western Slope, San Luis Valley, portions of the Eastern Plains are experiencing extreme drought conditions. Managing and conserving water is going to continue to grow in importance as, as we increase our demands on that water. Um, in terms of the water reduction plan, Pennsylvania offers a blueprint for Colorado. Pennsylvania regulations require the operators to submit a wastewater source reduction strategy that identifies the methods and procedures uh, in order to maximize the recycling and reuse of water, uh, flow back and produced water, uh, and it's working. There's a, a study that came out showing that in 2017, 52% of flow back and produced water from Pennsylvania wells was reused at well pads for oil and gas operations. Um, with that, uh, we'll actually finish up a little bit early. Um, appreciate your time, commissioners, and uh, all of us are available for questions. Mr. Samuelson, uh, we appreciate the testimony and appreciate the uh, witnesses that your panel has produced. Um, would ask if you could stop sharing and then I'll be in a better place to see all my commissioners. Thank you. Um, okay, um, we've got our witnesses before us on this panel. Um, would open it up for questions from commissioners and panelists do understand this is not uh, uh, weigh in against your time. We get to ask you questions without regard to the timing. Um, looking around, I see that Commissioner McGowan has unmuted. And uh, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs has a question, as does Messner. All right, well, we have a robust conversation here. Ms. McGowan. Um, thanks everybody for testifying today. A lot of interesting things that you've put on the table. Um, one, I, I think I need to understand a little better the difference between a census block and a census track and why one is better than another. And um, if you all saw the language yesterday, that Director Murphy proposed, I think it was, I think it was yesterday, sorry, the days are running together, um, with new language um, around census track versus census block and being close to humans, not just the block or the track itself, and if that language is an improvement. So I'll start with that question. Commissioner McGowan, I'm happy to start and then I might kick it over to Professor Dickinson. Um, the language that Director Murphy put forward yesterday, we, we are comfortable with it. However, you know, with the exception being that we would like the distance to be 2,640 feet rather than 2,000 feet. Um, you know, the, the idea is to provide, um, provide analysis on, that, on a site where there's a disproportionate impact of community. If it's within a census block group, um, because census block groups are non-uniform in size. They're based on a, a population number. It ranges between, I think, 600 and 1,500 people um, that you get a variety of sizes of, what, of how big or how small that census block group can be. And so we, we support uh, the language that was put forward by Director Murphy with the exception that we think that the analysis should occur if it's within 2,640 feet of a residential building unit, a high occupancy building unit, or a school. Um, I may ask Professor Dickinson to expound on the census track and census block group differentiation. Yeah, thank you. And I, I did not see the, the revised language, so um, I, I'll just comment on the, the distinction between a census tract um, and a census block group. A census tract is just larger, so it's a larger unit of um, of aggregation and just as uh, Mr. Samuelson just said, um, the, these are based on population size, not area. And so in a, in a small, dense um, urban area, right, if you look at the, the characteristics of that block group, they're reasonably uh, 
you know, uh, any, any point in that will sort of correspond to the people that are around um, that. But the problem is that as you have, uh, you know, rural, less densely populated areas, you could have the characteristics of a block group um, or a census tract uh, but if the, you know, the point that's being considered is right here, you don't know if it's, you know, the small minority of folks that are, you know, people of color, for example, that are located right next to the well, you know, there may be only 10% minority population in this block group, but if they're all right next to the location, um, that's not getting, that's not getting captured. So the smaller, the, 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 the reason that I would recommend um, for, for any area that any analysis that is going to use those census data um, using the block group rather than the census tract is simply because that's going to be a smaller um, area and so you're more likely to be capturing the characteristics of folks that are um, that are within the area of that of that proposed um, point and, and where and I think to, to the additional point wherever possible right do having characteristics um, of the individuals um, or, you know, using this, this distance to a, uh, an occupied structure um, is, is certainly preferable because you get away from this aggregate data problem. Commissioner McGowan, did you want to follow up? I'll defer to see what the other commissioners are going to ask you if they're the same things I have on my plate, but I think, Commissioner, I think Director Murphy wanted to add to the conversation. Director Murphy. Thank you, Commissioner and Chair. Thank you, Commissioner and Chair. Sorry, I forgot to turn my mic on. Um, I, so I wanted to offer that uh, staff fundamentally agrees that blocks are preferable over tracks. We included two of the tracks um, because we couldn't find the same data for income. Um, or I'm sorry, we only used it for one. We couldn't find the same information about income from a publicly available source that was at the block level or a block group level. And so if there's a different publicly available resource we could look to, um, I think we'd be very supportive of moving to census block groups um, across the board for all of the reasons that um, were articulated. Yeah, those data definitely should be available and I can, I can connect you with that. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Gibbs. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and really, this is, I'd say, more of a comment. Um, really appreciate the, the testimony from this group of panelists. Um, uh, Betsy Leonard's, Ms. Leonard's uh, comments definitely resonated with me. I'm a former county commissioner, so is uh, John Messner, a former county commissioner, too. Um, and just wanted to, to let you know that, you know, your voice is being heard. Um, even though um, you may feel like your county commissioners have not listened to you, um, you know, the, the, the genesis of Senate Bill 181 is really, you know, hearing from local communities, just like the folks like yourself that live in the Battlement Mesa area, and the legislators have heard loud and clear that we need to do things differently. Um, so I just want you to know that, you know, I feel like your voice has been heard and, and um, this process as we implement Senate Bill 181, um, it's a process, it's, it's a journey, and uh, we're not able to flip a switch overnight to make maybe the changes that you'd love to see right away. Um, but I just really appreciate um, you staying, staying with it, hanging with us, and, um, and we, are, we are listening and we want to try to get this right. So thank you. May I make a comment? Yes, Ms. Leonard. Um, part of the reason for testifying is that we want to keep other places in Colorado free of the things that we have gone through. Of course, we want to defeat the APAD because we think that's a horrible location. But many of our complaints have in one way or another been addressed or not addressed. The main thing is that we believe very strongly that one um, rule apply equally to all places in Colorado, urban or rural. Thank you. 
Ms. Leonard um, and Mr. Devaney, just to sort of follow up on this line of questioning, and then I'll turn to you, Commissioner Mesner. I know you had your hand up. Um, so, you know, we've heard from Garfield County and other communities that they indeed regulate in a manner that's protective and that um, their interpretation is that uh, the COGCC should not regulate um, and instead defer to them. Um, I take it that uh, you would probably disagree with that. Um, I'd, I'd like your comment about that and about the protective nature of your community's regulatory approach. Absolutely, well, I, I can speak to that. Uh, certainly, I can. We can understand somewhat the, uh, the position of the Garfield County. Uh, for many years, they have enjoyed the benefit of uh, oil and gas revenue. Uh, and at one point, uh, I think that was 75% of the revenue came from, from oil, and oil and gas um, extraction. Um, however, that has come at the expense of the, the citizens of, the, uh, of uh, Battlement Mesa in particular. So uh, that's why we feel strongly that there needs to be a, um, you know, a level of protection that is applied to all citizens, regardless of whether their community is considered rural or urban, or uh, whether you get a lot of oil and gas resources or not. We all know that things can change rapidly and uh, we want those protections in place uh, for now and, uh, now and for future generations. Thank you, Mr. Devaney. Uh, Commissioner Messner, I think you were up next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for that testimony. I found it um, very informative, uh, and so I thank you for that. I do have a couple of questions, um, just so that I'm clear as far as what the ask is. So, Mr. Sura, I think my first question probably goes to you, um, although anyone who would like to answer certainly can, but my understanding is that there's some concern with uh, Section 302C3, uh, which is the director's review of the local government citing information and that um, in, in that um, section three, it indicates that the director will defer to the relevant local government citing disposition. Um, however, the way that I read it, and as I cross reference the different elements here, it basically says um, 302 C3 says the director will defer to the local government citing information if it does not trigger any of the elements of uh, that would require uh, alternative location analysis by the state. And so in that instance, um, if it does not trigger, you know, a fairly robust list of requirements that could get more robust uh, as this rulemaking proceeds, why would the state not defer to the local government citing um, if it did not trigger an ALA? Thank you for the question. And uh, that is exactly the point that we are trying to make. This alternative location analysis is extremely important. One, because an alternative location analysis is probably, in my experience in the last 20 years, the most useful tool for finding alternative locations and avoiding entirely you know, most of those impacts to communities. Um, and because you're using this alternative location analysis as a, a way to trigger whether or not um, you're going to give local governments deference to their siting decisions, it has even more importance. Um, and the fact that right now your alternative location analysis would not be triggered if there were 40 wells in 50 tanks proposed 501 feet from nine homes. Okay, so I, I understand now. So you don't actually have an issue with if it doesn't trigger an ALA deferring to the local government siting. You're just indicating that the the ALA the things that trigger an ALA need to be more stringent. That's that's exactly right, and I think that um, there's been some conflation of the alternative location analysis and setbacks. And again. An alternative location analysis is just a useful tool to avoid impacts. I, I don't know why you would have it be just um, 501 feet, you know, from nine homes. You know, if, if you feel like, as has been stated um, in the 
the director's criteria, you know, since, um, since Senate Bill 181 was passed, uh, they were looking at 1,500 feet as the measuring point for considering impacts to, to homes. Um, we've now got a, a 2,000 foot uh, consideration after a CDPHE study came out. Um, 2,000 feet away from a home is what we think is appropriate in trying to um, identify alternative locations. Again, you know, the better operators are already doing this alternative location analysis. They stated so uh, yesterday. All we're asking that they do is show their work. Yeah, you know, let's no, I, try to locate these facilities as far away from, from homes as possible. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. And I, you know, I, um, yeah, I do believe that the alternative location analysis is a, is a strong tool uh, for helping an entity, a regulatory entity review um, the siting of these. And so I appreciate your comments there. I was just trying to understand if you had an issue with, um, you know, the, the, the local government siting, um, if it did not trigger the ALA. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the, you know, the interest in utilizing, um, more criteria for, uh, requiring an ALA. Um, so thank you for that. The other question I had, uh, and this is probably to Mr. Samuelson, um, I wonder if you could provide a little more information. I have not read this Pennsylvania um, water reduction plan proposal, um, and I wonder if you could just share a little bit about what uh, you think are the important elements in that plan that could be utilized um, in something that we would Create. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner Meshner. Um, I think the importance of, they call it a, a source reduction strategy, water source reduction strategy, is that the operator in Pennsylvania's version of a Form 2A is asked to submit a plan on how they're going to um, re uh, reuse or recycle that water. And so the sort of the, where it comes into um, being important is that it puts that on the table as a consideration for that operator. Um, you know, they're not, they not required to do so, you know, but they are required to submit a plan. They're required to update it annually. Um, and then they are also required to submit um, an annual report that, that describes how much water they reused or recycled. And so I think you know, the, the importance of it is just putting that out there is, you know, you need to have a plan um, and it creates, it creates that expectation of being able to do so. And by annually updating it, it allows, um, I think, both the operators and the regulators to really take advantage of new technology that's coming out around how to reuse and recycle that water. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Messner, uh, Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for your testimony this morning. It was very um, helpful, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate kind of understanding your perspective from right there uh, in the midst of it all. Um, one thing that uh, Ms. Roberts, you had mentioned, um, was uh, the subdivision um, in which you're in. Um, it, it, it sounds like there is only one way in and one way out. And the, the location uh, that you were describing was very close to the entrance of, yes. of the subdivision, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you were suggesting that if it was, if the location was at least 2000 feet away, you feel that would be sufficiently safe for being able to evacuate in the case of an emergency? Well, if it was in a different location, that didn't use our only access road, yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be, that would relieve the problem of if we had to evacuate. Both the uh, trucks in and out to that location and all of our vehicles. And then there's about 80 homes to the south of us that also have to use the same road. We would all have to use that road, that one road in and out, uh, and it would not allow us to get out. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I had um, lived for a while up in, um, up in Pine in a neighborhood that was in a similar situation and just for wildfire considerations, um, you know, that was always a concern. 
Um, I'm curious, um, Director Murphy or um, AAG Minor, um, I know we have a requirement for an emergency response plan. Do, what does that include um, with respect to, um, I know there's some, I believe there's something with respect to notifying the um, local communities, but is there coordination regarding evacuation or um, other related sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, other related con considerations for the, the communities? Commissioner Nanjapa, I'm happy to try to answer that question. Um, the, the emergency management plan is found in proposed rule 602J, um, and it does not specify a lot of um, criteria that have to be included in every emergency management plan. The goal is for the operator to coordinate with the local emergency response agency um, about what is appropriate according to that local emergency response agency. And I think that that makes a lot of sense because in part um, control of traffic on roads that are not just access roads. So for example, a, a county road is within the jurisdiction of a, a local government to do and therefore making sure that um, the local emergency response agencies are in the driver's seat means that there is an opportunity for them to coordinate with operators on matters like traffic and, and access to a site that are appropriate. Um, among other things, Rule 602J does specify that those emergency response plans have to be updated at a frequency identified by the local emergency response plan, which means that that local emergency response agency might say, you know, a lot has changed in terms of new roads being built in this area in the last six months, we need another update, or it might mean that um, if nothing is particularly changing for the way that that local emergency response agency manages um, that area, they might not get updated quite as frequently. Um, and Mr. Leonard, uh, Mike Leonard, uh, the manager of our field inspection unit, will be providing a lot more detail about Rule 602J when we get to the 600 series. and can probably answer more specific questions better than I can. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I realize this was not, um, that was not a question directly related to 300 series, but since it was kind of, you know, brought forward in the testimony, I just wanted to better understand um, a little bit about that, but look forward to additional information um, later on in the hearings. Thank you. Commissioner McGowan. To piggyback onto this conversation though, um, in the 300 series, we do require mapping and drawings. And I'm wondering if the conversation of access in and out to a neighborhood would be a part of the conversation when those materials are submitted by the operator. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, Commissioner McGowan and I will try to answer that again. And I think some of the exact details there may be um, a great question for Mr. Duranlo. So maybe if he can join, he can provide more detail. Um, certainly aspects of the Form 2A application um, as required by Rule 304B includes detailed maps and drawings of a location, which I believe do include access roads. Um, in terms of traffic management, again, that's a challenging issue because um, traffic on the actual access roads that are built, built specifically to access the location does fall within the Commission's jurisdiction and is something that, of course, um, staff are paying close attention to in processing applications. Um, thinking about traffic on the actual um, county roads that might be used to get to those um, or, or, or state highways, any other type of, of road that might be used to actually get to the access road um, is a little more tricky, but there are definitely opportunities for staff to work with operators to identify appropriate um, traffic plans. So I think we have uh, Mr. Duranlo on now, if he wants to add a little bit of uh, color to what I just said, or Director Murphy. Yeah, yeah I appreciate that, Mr. Miner. And I, I would say that, you know, that is a consideration that we can take on the Form 2A review. Am I not muted? You're fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> um, and in the case of the Swan Pad, it was it was brought very much front and center by both the local government, um, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment consultation, um, and became a you know clearly an, a, an an item of discussion for COGCC in our conversations with the operator. What alternatives are available for 
egress. Um, you know, so when brought forward as appropriate, it is certainly part of the discussion. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Commissioner McGowan. Chair, so going back to the conversation with Commissioner, Commissioner Mesner, um, in the testimony, you all were saying, sorry, I, got, I was taking notes, um, that you wanted clear specific requirements for anything closer than 2,000 feet. So I, I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to clarify, the thing that you think is missing from the alternative analysis location is for the commission to consider um, when an LA, a ALA is triggered related to distance and I'm making sure that you don't think there's anything else missing for the alternative location analysis, that that's the thing that we're honing in on in your testimony today. That is what we uh, focused our, our testimony on. Um, certainly we have uh, provided additional uh, comments on the alternative location analysis in a different section we have uh, indicated that there needs to be very clear criteria as to how these alternative locations are judged and somebody to judge them. Um, right now, you know, I, I think that the example that, um, that Greg Duranlo uh, proposed in the, the County of Yeti yesterday, you know, shows kind of how things look. <laughs> I mean, it, it seemed um, like, a, like a crazy example, but you're going to hear from Commerce City today, and, and a lot of those things exist in the real world. Um, and you're weighing whether uh, it's better to put uh, an, a location near a home or, you know, within a floodplain. And ultimately, you know, if you can't avoid any one of those locations, um, you're either making a judgment and you're mitigating or you're denying. And um, so, we would really like to see that criteria. Um, Commerce City and, and uh, I think Adams County put forward some really excellent recommendations as to um, the choice needs to be the one that is going to best protect public health, safety, welfare, and the environment, as is your mandate. Thank you. Commissioner Gonzalez. Yes, good morning. Um, I wanted to circle back on, on the d disproportionately impacted communities and, and the census data. I know we've talked about this a little bit um, with staff yesterday and uh, the, the testimony provided by Dr. Dickinson today offered kind of a different perspective. You know, some of the materials we've reviewed suggest the census tracts would over represent um, disproportionately impacted communities and, uh, and Dr. Dickinson suggests that it could possibly underrepresent um, disproportionately community, disproportionately impacted communities. And, um, you know, there's been some, some evolve, uh, evolution with the, uh, with the rules going from a census tract to census block groups. And I'd like to distinguish the census block groups from census blocks, which seems to be an even more granular way of, of looking at the census data. And the only difference I, I seem to, to, to understand from, from the various, uh, parties who have, testified on this is that census tracts are bigger, census blocks are smaller, or census block groups are smaller and census blocks are yet smaller. And what I'm getting at is, is what's the best way to take the most precise approach so that we can eliminate or avoid in, in most circumstances over or under representing the impacts to disproportionately, community, disproportionately impacted communities and, um, and the representation of those communities. Yeah, this is this is a really tricky thing, and again, it's something that we look a lot in our in our research. And I um, would be have actually already reached out to uh, my colleague uh, Ben Allshouse, who is our our spatial uh, geospatial um, data uh, expert. So so he would be able to answer some of these questions um, in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, your First, just to confirm, you're correct. Block is the smallest um, census uh, unit. Then those, you know, multiple blocks are in a block group, and multiple block groups are in a tract. So as you, so those are those are in order in terms of um, size. And um, the the problem is, uh, yeah, it really is going to depend on the characteristics of the area. 
area, whether the tract, so, so for example, right, if you have a very wealthy block group, and then the, you know, but then, so if you have a tract that has one very wealthy block group, and then multiple, you know, low income block groups, then, um, you know, overall that tract may be 50% but the block group where the well is being proposed um, maybe is not as high income, right? And then you can see the same the same thing, thing happening in the other direction. Um, so the the again the the issue is that really what you want to know is if the if this is the point at which uh, you know a well pad site is proposed, what are the characteristics of folks that are in a thousand two thousand 2,600 feet of, of that um, proposed site, um, if those are going to be the folks again, from the health and, and safety perspective who are most impacted. And so the smaller the spatial unit, the more likely you are to be capturing the characteristics of that area. Now there are complications if you're right at the border, right, there's this other aggregation thing where if you're right at the border between two census block groups and Maybe the site, you know, is just across the border in the in the high income block group, um, but it's going to be very close to um, houses that are that are across the border in the low income block group, right? Then just using that block group's characteristics also is is problematic. Um, and just also the other the point to clarify: the reason I'm not advocating using the block the smallest level is simply a matter of data av availability. So the publicly available um, data, typically uh, the smallest unit that you're going to find that available is at the block group level. Um, in order to access the block level data, you actually have to go to a restricted data center and um, to sit in the room and only view the, the data there. Um, so, so I hope that helps somewhat. And, and as I said, I think we have other uh, team members who might be able to, to provide even more granular data. Uh, uh, that, that, that definitely helps, you know, kind of distinguish the, the lack of, of data associated with the blocks and, and why we need to kind of move up to the next geographic hierarchy of the block groups. Right. Um, I, and I think uh, I'm just, I'm still wrestling with, with this. I think that, that the DIC um, part of the rules is extremely important. Um, and I just want to make sure that we get it right and that we're, we're precise enough to, uh, to really address those impacts. So I appreciate the, uh, the distinguishing um, between the, the blocks and the block groups that helps. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other questions from commissioners? Mr. Sir, um, or Mr. Samuelson, just uh, talking to the lawyers here, you guys um, have uh, brought up the ALA as a effective tool. Um, I guess if we could make sure everybody's got muted um, so that we don't have overlap, thank you. Um, you know, one of the questions that came up yesterday um, is, you know, you can do an ALA if it meets one of the criteria, and you can find the quote best of say a couple of different locations. Um, do you believe that the rules as drafted also allow commissioner director to say, you know, that might be the best, but it's still not approvable because it's not protective? You know, I believe that um, you do have uh, the ability and the director has the ability to recommend denial. Um, and that's in a different place in, in the regulations. Um, you know, one of the things that, that was hard to, to hear is that, you know, in, in, in Yeti County, there's somebody that's gonna have uh, an oil and gas facility less than 500 feet from their home. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, and, and I understand what Greg was doing and I thought he did a great job with that. But um, ultimately, you know, the, the end of the day, uh, you know, that Yeti County uh, example highlights, you know, the, the stark choices that the staff is going to have to make. Um, and ultimately, there may be places, um, downtown Denver is an example, uh, where there shouldn't be any oil and gas development because there's not going to be an appropriate location. Mr. Samuelson, any comments on that? Mr. Durallo? No, I think Mr. Sarah covered it. Okay. 
Other questions for this panel? Uh, Director Murphy, you've unmuted yourself. Thank, thank you, Chair. And this is a, a little bit unusual. I don't um, usually ask questions, but if um, Mr. Starr and Mr. Samuelson would let me, I wanted to ask kind of a follow along question to Commissioner Gonzalez's question um, uh, of Ms. Dickinson in that if we structure the rules so that we're measuring to um, from the pad to a building unit that is within the block group or tract. Um, does that help alleviate the concern as compared to just having the rule initiated if the pad itself is proposed in a, in a community, a DI community? Um, I think that that helps address some of the refinement issues in that we're like measuring from the pad to the building unit and the, the, proc the, if the, it's, if the building unit is within the tractor block group, not whether the pad is. Um, could you maybe restate that? I'm, I'm, I, I think I see where you're going, but, um, but yeah, could you just rephrase that? Would it be okay if I tried to pull up the language that we walked through yesterday? And I will absolutely acknowledge that showing it to you and asking your opinion is a little bit unfair. So, um, <laughs> If you can, yeah. Give me just a moment, please. So this is the slide that I showed yesterday. Oops, sorry. I'm still apparently an amateur at PowerPoint. Um, but to me, it helps illustrate that what we want to capture is whether the pad is in proximity to a building unit within a disproportionately impacted community. And I think that's what these words are trying to articulate. Um, is that level of precision. So just because a pad is in a tractor block that might be captured isn't as important as whether the building unit in proximity to it is also within that block group or tract. Right, and I think the only, um, so, so I agree that this, uh, this is better. I think the, um, Again, I think the, the only complication I can see here is this border issue. So say you've got low, you know, low or, or the criteria would say this is a disproportionately impacted block group and this is not, right? And then your proposed site is right here. Okay, so you're not in a disproportionately impacted block group, but then maybe you've got homes right here that are within 2,000 feet, and they're um, and they're you know the disproportionately impacted block group. So so it's just that borders problem, that 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 spatial unit problem. So so if you're trying to say this is this is it a disproport which is the disproportionately impacted community, and are you defining community using those census units? The only problem that you run into well. A few problems, but but one problem that you run into there is then this issue of of borders. So may, maybe um, you know in that case, I think what you'd want to know is what are the characteristics of both of these black groups, right? If there's sort of a radius, a 2,000 foot radius of the proposed site, well then that would cross this block group and this block group, and you'd want to know if either one of those is would be, would be meeting these disproportionately impacted criteria. I think Director Murphy, as I'm reading this, is that that you know the language of this is that the proposed working pad does not have to be in that census block group that has been identified as a disproportionately impacted community, and so if it is <clears throat> within, and I'll use our number, 2,640 feet from a residential building unit, high occupancy building unit, or a school that is inside of that census block group, then it seems to me that hopefully we could 
that that, that would uh, address this sort of uh, jurisdictional question. Um, if I'm reading that in the same way that you are, that if the proposed working bag could be in a, <clears throat> a excuse me, a unit that is not a census unit that is not considered disproportionately impacted. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think if I'm rereading that, um, that, that would make sense. If, if the structure was in a disproportionately impacted community and the well pad was in 2,000 feet of it, then, then that would, would trigger that. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I, I, and I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Director Murphy. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think that's what I was trying to articulate with these revisions. And so, um, you know, it's up to the commission, but I wanted to make sure that what I thought I said was consistent with the concern that you were articulating. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm sorry, and thank you all for indulging me a little bit. You know, if I could just elaborate on that example, I think that this example works as well for why we think mobile home parks should be included. Um, you know, because we're not looking, if a mobile home park is in a census block group, we're not looking to have that entire census block group be defined as a disproportionately impacted community, just the, just that actual location of the mobile home park. And that kind of is similar in terms of this like crossing of a, a census block group jurisdictional line example. Great, thank you all. Um, really great discussion. Uh, Director Murphy, feel free to be involved in this discussion. You're helping us get to the right spot. And sometimes your questions are entirely appropriate. The commissioners may not have picked up. So um, with that, do we see, is there anyone else with questions? I have kind of one final comment, um, but I want to make sure we've gotten through questions. All right, well, I'm not seeing anybody. Uh, un oh, actually, uh, Commissioner Putnam has unmuted himself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had a question either for Professor Dickinson or the attorneys on the call. Um, first, I would like to thank Professor Dickinson to, um, for being involved with our Disadvantaged Communities Working Group um, over at Air Pollution Control Division. It's absolutely critical work and really appreciate your contributions um, to that. Um, did have a question about the suggested language that you had um, related to the reporting on engagement with disadvantaged communities um, on that process. And it kind of creates a standard in the reporting or an implied standard in the reporting and wonder whether it would be better just to lay out what the expectations are in a kind of affirmative positive way and then have them report on, you know, how they, they meet those standards. Um, as opposed to kind of just reporting out on whether you did certain things. Um, thanks, Commissioner Putnam. I, yeah, I hear your suggestion. And I think, you know, sometimes when we get into the legalese that it, we have the, uh, you know, including but not limited to type of language. And, and um, I hear your concern about including including language turns into a ceiling instead of a floor. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to, to have a conversation around what's the what's the appropriate language to to really just get at the heart of like, you know, the best practices for hosting um, a community meeting. That's really the end goal. It, it's not really about checking the boxes on one or two or three different things. It's it's how can we how can we create and set up the process so that we're actually hosting an appropriate meeting that, that really fits the needs for the agency, the operator, and the community. Yeah, and just to, to weigh in on that quickly, I, I think that is, that's the challenge, right, is, is creating um, requirements that, that, um, that, are, that, that can't be turned around to just be, I check these boxes and, and jump through these hoops and um, but you know what what we think of as actual community engagement and, and what the you know community members who testify today like what what does that what would it actually have looked like for them to be um, to be partners in this decision making process to feel like their voices were heard to feel like their concerns were addressed um, 
and and then how do you do you mandate that uh, you know that everyone go through um, that process and and you know I am a, an academic and, and not a lawyer and and this uh, this landscape is 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 new to me so um, I, I can. Um, think about it, ways of, of kind of measuring if this has happened or not, but um, I agree that it's a, a challenge. Um, but I think, you know, community input um, in this particular piece of what would, if you were going to say, this is what community involvement looks like, um, that, you know, folks like, um, you know, Ms. Leonard, um, uh, who's on the call today, uh, Mr. Devaney, Devani, um, you know, their input in, in that I think would be really valuable to say what, what would that have looked like or what would that look like for them going forward to, to feel like um, they're actually being heard. Commissioner Putnam, any follow-up? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you both for those answers. Great. Well, um, Seeing, uh, it looks like we've um, exhausted our questions. I, I just wanted to sort of finish up with uh, kudos to Ms. Roberts uh, for your testimony and for your diligence on the swan pad uh, and your community's diligence there. Um, I, I'm just really look at that as sort of indicative of, of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you couldn't get an ALA uh, out of the uh, previous operator. And in, in your testimony, you didn't speak to it today, but in your written testimony, you spoke to the fact that the previous operator, you know, sort of flew the flag that you don't have standing to be able to argue uh, or to be able to articulate your concerns. Um, and, you know, you, you, you point out the, the concerns about not being protective enough. And, and then you, you know, had a happy ending in that another operator came in and actually did an ALA and uh, understood standing and, uh, you know, allowed for a different location to be identified. And that's what this is all about. And so I really applaud uh, your uh, testimony um, and your community's uh, continued involvement. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that 181 came into being. And um, I hope we do a good job of, of, of implementing it so that uh, communities such as yours are heard. Um, and that we create a, a permitting protocol to get to good solutions. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Um, yeah, there's an, an asterisk beside the happy ending. We have a meeting, the community has a meeting with uh, Crestone next Thursday. And in that meeting, we hope to get some questions answered. They have not yet told us where the alternative location is going to be. So we're crossing our fingers that they have been listening to these hearings as well and understand the importance of putting it in a safe place. So thank you for your comments, I appreciate it. Great, thank you to this panel. Uh, we appreciate your taking time out of your day and uh, presenting to us. Um, we will allow this panel to be uh, dismissed as panelists thank you. and we'll bring on our next panel. Um, which is the environmental uh, group, quote, panel, Broomfield Health and Safety First Citizens Groups and Oil and Gas Education Project. So give us a moment to switch panelists and then we'll move forward with our next panel. And then uh, probably after that, we'll take our first morning break. Uh, sorry, am I unmuted? This is uh, Michael Freeman. You give us just a sec, Mike. Um, sure. Let me make sure we've got all your group uh, online, and let me make sure we take off the previous group. It looks like we still have Miss Roberts online. Okay, Mike, are you able to identify that all of your witnesses are panelists now? Uh, so three of us are on. There's myself, Tom Delahanty, and Emily Bear. Uh, Christian von Wittenberg, there he is there now. Is. So we're all we're all on now. Thank you. Okay. And how much time does this panel have, Ms. Larson? Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Yes. All right, Mr. Freeman. Hey, thank you. Uh, I'll start by uh, sharing my screen if I could here, and then calling up my presentation. 
Uh, can everyone see the slides now? We can. Great, thank you. Uh, so good morning. Um, as we indicated, my name is Michael Freeman and I'll be speaking for the environmental groups today. I'd like to start first by thanking the commission staff and the commissioners for all your hard work putting these rules together and working with stakeholders to develop the staff proposal. Um, we know it's been a long process and there's still a lot of work left to be done, but there's a lot of really positive steps in these 300 series rules. And we think they'll go a long way towards better protecting Coloradans and in, in, in our environment. Um, I won't go through in detail the legal issue regarding local government primacy, but we strongly support the staff support approach here of recognizing that state and local governments have co-equal authority over surface impacts and that operators must comply with both state and local regulations. Uh, that approach is consistent with the language and the intent of SB 181 and we urge the commission to, to follow staff's recommended legal uh, framework here. Uh, in our pre-hearing statements, we addressed a number of issues with the 300 series, but I'll focus today on cumulative impacts. Uh, I'll address our, some of our concerns with the proposed cumulative impact uh, regulation. And then we have testimony from two residents of Erie, uh, Christian von Wuttenberg and, and Emily Baer, who will talk about their experience with cumulative impacts and the need for a, a strong state regulatory floor. Uh, and then I'd like to reserve uh, five minutes for a vote. Uh, so with regard to cumulative impacts, uh, as others have pointed out, SB 181 requires the regulations to not just analyze cumulative impacts, but also to address them. And while we very much appreciate staff's effort in, in putting the rules together and, and providing uh, changes to them last week, uh, we feel that as proposed, the staff rules don't quite meet the requirements of, of SB 181. Um, you know, for definitional purposes, what cumulative impacts refer to are the environmental impact of a proposed well when that impact is combined with other past and future drilling and the impacts of other activities in the same area. And the purpose of analyzing cumulative impacts is to provide context for the commission. You know, one drilling one well in an area may have only limited impacts there, but if different multiple operators are developing several multi-well pads over a period of several years, that can severely disrupt an area with combined and additive pollution, traffic, habitat fragmentation, and other combined impacts. But unless the commission looks at that larger context when it's reviewing each permit application, it will end up missing the forest for the trees. The staff proposed rule 303A5 anticipates doing broad regional or statewide cumulative impacts analysis on, on air quality and, and probably for some other resources. Um, and its CIDR effort would require operators to submit much more detailed information so that the commission and, and CDPHE can use that information to develop regional or statewide cumulative impacts analyses. Um, and we think those are very important steps and we absolutely support the efforts that the, the staff is proposing to develop regional or statewide analyses. But there's a very important missing piece here and that's that the proposed rules don't require analyzing cumulative impacts at the more localized level. Um, they only focus on regional cumulative impacts. Um, for example, the, you know, the August 17th draft of 303A5 drops any requirement to do a cumulative impacts analysis as part of each oil and gas development plan or, or each permit. Um, and that's a, a major omission. Um, we think the cumulative impacts analysis should be required for every permit application. Um, now, for an example, to illustrate why, why we're asking for this, I'd like to look at the Yeti Ca County illustration that was used yesterday. Um, we think this is a, we're using it because this slide is a really great illustration of, of alternative location analyses and, and how, what the process would look like uh, for looking at alternative locations for a particular permit in a particular area. But 
what may be the case here is that even though the commissions and the staff are looking at where to locate one particular well pad, there could be a hundred other wells that another operator is proposing a half mile away, just outside the yellow boundary here. Um, and that's not covered unless the, unless the permit applicant is providing a cumulative impacts analysis. But if, if there are dozens of other wells planned in the surrounding area, that really totally changes the alternative location analysis, the uh, analysis of, of potential impacts. Um, and, it, you know, and, and it really puts the impacts of that one pad in a much different light. Unfortunately, without requiring cumulative impacts analysis for each permit, that broader picture gets overlooked. Uh, yesterday, we heard a, a, some, about some other proposed rules that, that, are, that are in the mix here, but we don't think those other rules really, really fill that gap. Um, for example, uh, the staff can require a cumulative impacts plan for individual permits, but the rules don't provide any trigger for when that plan would be required. And the statement of basis of purpose indicates the staff only anticipates requiring that permit level uh, cumulative impacts plan only very rarely. Um, it says that in the statement of basis of purpose. Um, there's also a discussion of the operational series, the 400 series operational rules for things like noise and dust, but those rules won't address the potential for other sites being proposed nearby. It won't address wildlife impacts, and those 400 series rules won't address other cumulative impacts like, for example, if low-lying topography in an area may result in local air toxics collecting and concentrating for multiple well sites. Um, you also heard a lot of discussion yesterday about caps as a way to address cumulative impacts. And we strongly support caps, but our, from what we would suggest is that if a robust cumulative impacts analysis is required for every permit, that requirement itself creates a major incentive for operators to actually do caps. Because if they have to do the cumulative impacts analysis for every permit, there's major, major cost efficiencies in doing that cumulative impacts analysis on a larger scale as part of a cap. Um, and so we think, you know, requiring a site-specific permit-specific cumulative impacts analysis aligns the incentives in the way that will help push operators to do caps. Um, at the same time, that th those incentives don't create the risks of unintended consequences that um, are presented by some of the incentives in existing Rule 314. Um, and in fact, that's what happens on federal lands. Um, on, for federal permitting, operators need to do a NEPA analysis for every permit. Um, and in, but instead of doing that, what they'll often do is do what's called a master development plan that considers multiple well pads, multiple wells across a larger area. Um, and they do that for the simple reason that it's much more efficient to do the analysis, to look at cumulative impacts one time as part of a master development plan than it is to do it on a permit by permit basis. And we suggest that the commission could take the same approach here. Now, um, we recognize that cumulative impacts are a new requirement for the commission, but they're not a new concept or a new idea. Uh, as Ann Morgan described yesterday, um, the federal government and other states have been addressing cumulative impacts for, for years. And there's lots of experiment, experience and guidance on how to do them. Um, and contrary to what you heard the industry parties arguing yesterday, complying with the requirement of SB 181 to do a cumulative impacts analysis won't be incredibly burdensome and it won't require the commission to look at an infinite time frame or some unlimited geographic scope. What it simply requires is that the commission do a reasonable, make a reasonable forecast of what's foreseeable in the same area as the proposed well. And for an oil and gas development plan for, for a specific permit, that analysis is really fairly modest. Um, in API's written testimony, this was offered by, by Don Martin in her written testimony, um, they estimate that doing a cumulative impacts analysis for a 175 well project would take about two to three weeks of work. We think that's a reasonable time frame, and it won't prevent the commission from having a timely and efficient permitting process. Um, so we've uh, 
it provided red lines with our pre-hearing statements, and we've updated those in light of last week's revisions to 303. Um, I won't go into uh, our specific proposals here, but we've included them in our PowerPoint. We'll submit them with the PowerPoint for your reference, um, but we're happy to uh, answer any questions about them um, when we get to that point of the presentation. Um, so finally, um, we do have a number of other concerns with the uh, 300 series rules. We, we raised these in our pre-hearing statements, and I'm happy to answer any questions about them. Um, those are issues like the need to define, protect, and minimize. Um, our proposal that the commission use the social cost of carbon to analyze, to get you know, actionable, useful information on cumulative climate impacts. Um, and then there is one issue that we couldn't address in our pre-hearing statements because it only came to the surface with the statement of basis and purpose language released last week. But we do have some significant concerns about um, the statement of basis per and purpose language regarding uh, 308D and confining layers. Um, we're, as I said, we're happy to answer any questions about those issues or others. But first, I'll hand it over to Christian to, to testify about his experience with cumulative impacts. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to allow us to speak. Uh, let me go ahead and get my screen sharing going here. My name is Christian Van Woodenberg. I am a trustee for the town of Erie. I'm also uh, the leader of a local grassroots activist organization. Um, but most of all, I come to you today as the father of uh, two intelligent and wonderful teenage daughters and to represent a community, not only of disproportionately impacted residents um, as an activist, but as a trustee for the town to represent my constituents. What I wanted to cover briefly today was um, the, the cumulative impact of oil and gas activity in Erie. First, I'd like to cover the, uh, the oil and gas exploration that has occurred in Erie over the past five or six years um, since really the, the advent of horizontal drilling. Um, for me, as an impacted resident in 2014, we were first faced with this when Encana came to drill at the Pratt site 800 feet north of my home and had a bit of a disastrous effort to drill the first well at Pratt. Um, given technology advancements over the next several years, in particular the advent of diesel-based drilling muds, Crestone Peak Resources was able to return to the Pratt site and waste connections. Um, and drill the remaining 12 wells at those pads. Um, and then at a site called Coyote Trails, about three quarters of a mile east of me, um, more recently extraction has drilled um, 27 wells and uh, has another 12 form two permits um, in with the COGCC to continue the drilling there. Overall in the town of Erie, um, we have currently 149 active wells, of which 108 are producing, um, another 176 that have been plugged and abandoned. In terms of how that looks in the, the landscape next to my home, um, at the center of this graphic, you will see my home designated with a, a red star, um, active locations in green, plugged and abandoned locations in orangey red, um, from the, the COGCC GIS applications. Looking a bit more closely um, at the previous graphic, uh, I wanna draw your attention to, again, my home here um, on the lower right-hand corner, the Pratt pad, uh, 800 feet north of me, the waste connections pad, about 0.6 miles to the, the west, and then a bit of a unique feature um, that we haven't seen a lot in Colorado when Crestone Peak Resources came to drill was the temporary completions pad um, where they staged the frack operations. So as a resident in 2014, um, I was first <laughs> made aware of the practice of hydraulic fracturing and unconventional oil and gas exploration 
when Nkana came to drill behind my home. Uh, this is a, a view from my back deck. What also happened is that um, with those operations, we were inundated with noise and odor and issues of air quality. So as um, someone with a, a background in molecular biology and the life sciences, I purchased a noise meter and started taking those measurements. And we consistently found noise measurements coming from the Pratt pad and the temporary completions pad and waste connections. Um, that exceeded 70 decibels on the DVC scale quite regularly and made it awfully difficult to sleep, um, to enjoy our own property, and to spend any time outdoors. In response to the visual sound walls that hid everything from view, um, I actually was one of the first people in Colorado as a, a resident to buy a drone. And that for me was to answer the question of what's going on inside those walls? Um, that's making it so difficult to enjoy my property. So this is the view of the Pratt pad. Um, the red arrow in the background is my home. This is the view of the waste connections pad. My home is in the top left. And finally, the, the real issue here is the temporary completions pad, where Custom Peak Resources used um, a fleet of the Liberty Frac Quiet Fleet with 26 frac pumps um, to frack the wells at Waste Connections and Pratt. This activity occurred day in, day out um, for months at a time. Um, this is a view at night of the operations showing the, the flare in the foreground um, and, and the frack operation happening within the sound walls. As I mentioned earlier, to the east of us, just outside of the town of Erie um, and outside of the town of Broomfield is the Coyote Trails drilling pad. And I don't have high resolution drone footage to show for this um, because in response to posting those videos on social media, I was served with a, a cease and desist letter from extraction oil and gas. And after consulting with my attorney, took down all the video footage of extraction operations and agreed not to fly my drones over any extraction operations in the future. So in particular here, the red arrow points out the location of the Coyote Trails pad. Um, again, this is from the COGCC GIS application and shows how um, extraction chose to site Coyote Trails within unincorporated Weld County what less than 200 feet outside of the municipality boundaries of Erie and Broomfield, meaning that the town of Erie um, as a municipality had no standing to enforce additional regulations upon that operation, but whose residents had to suffer from the cumulative impacts and the nuisances of noise, odor, and air quality issues from that pad. Um, as we all know, those issues don't respect municipal boundaries. The next thing I'd like to talk about very briefly um, is the issue of the legacy of oil and gas infrastructure in our town. Um, that we as residents are not only disproportionately impacted by the drilling and completions operations of these new um, horizontal drilling sites, but we also have to suffer through the plug and abandon operations of these um, legacy vertical and directional wells. So here is um, the Vessels Minerals plug and abandon operation next to Aspen Ridge Prep, which resulted in a notice of alleged violation for Crestone Peak Resources. Here's another one in the Erie Highlands neighborhood. Here's another one at Erie High School um, and the Soaring Heights PK-8, where my two children attend. Here's another one in Vista Point. And here's another one in Coal Creek, which is in a floodway. Um, and just to underscore that, um, you know, we, we as residents and a municipality suffer through the cumulative impacts of these oil and gas sites, not only for the time that they're being drilled and completed, but for the entire duration of their life, um, and especially during the plug and abandon operation. 
So the parting thought that I really wanted to leave you all with um, is that if we only treated unconventional oil and gas exploration like we do every other industry, the practice of residential drilling would cease to exist. And very briefly, for the, the Pratt site that we all suffered through, if that had been a marijuana grow operation, um, I don't think it would have been permitted for use um, to begin with because that land is zoned low density residential. But if those operations had contributed the same noise and odor and air quality issues as we saw with the Pratt operation, it would have been shut down immediately. Um, so re really what I'm asking in terms of uh, cumulative impacts is that you take into account the long-term impacts of the infrastructure, of the maintenance operations, of plug and abandonment, as you consider rewriting these rules and any application to drill in a municipality like Erie or nearby that has already suffered so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Freeman, um, do you have? Thank you. And now um, we'd like uh, to present Emily Bear for her testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Emily Bear. My family and I moved to Erie in 2016. In fact, Mr. Van Woonenberg and I live in the same neighborhood. I'm here to ask you to adopt strong rules requiring evaluation of cumulative impacts. Like Mr. Van Woodenberg, we are surrounded by oil and gas operations. We can see the Weiss Connections well pad from our dining room window. And as Christiane mentioned, work began on those wells in 2017, the year after we moved into our home. Um, as Christiane mentioned, there are 13 wells between the Weiss Connections and the Pratt site nearby. A mile due east of us is that Coyote Trail site. It's my understanding that there are 27 wells drilled and an additional 12 Form 2s filed there. There are also many other sites and proposed sites in neighborhoods around us, well pads with names like Livingston, Cornflower, May J, William Peltier, Hippen. Acme is proposed to be drilled with 30 wells just down the street from my house, 500 feet away from the nearest home. In fact, more than 19,000 of Colorado's over 51,000 wells are in Weld County, where I live. These wells are drilled by different companies, each independently seeking approvals from COGCC over the course of several years. But we don't experience them in isolation. The pollution, traffic, decrease in home values from all of that drilling combine and, and we're inundated. We need the state to look at bigger picture at the bigger picture when considering well pad applications. Think about the broader context of what you're approving. It's important to recognize uh, the negative impacts from ne from neighborhood drilling are not theoretical. They're actual, and people are suffering them now today along the Front Range. In 2018, my bright, charming, active, soccer-playing seven-year-old son began vomiting, and he didn't stop for five months. We took him to numerous appointments with doctors and specialists and spent many scary hours in the ER. He underwent a brutal and extensive litany of tests, pokes, and exams, none of which brought any answers or relief. The tests ruled out kidney failure, liver damage, type 1 diabetes, the four most common cancers, structural abnormalities, food allergies, growths, and tumors. Eventually, a nurse asked me how close the nearest fracking well was to our home. She had seen his symptoms before in people living near oil and gas facilities. When we had finally exhausted the list of maladies to test for, our efforts turned to treatments focused on healing injuries in his gut that may have been caused or exacerbated by exposure to the kinds of chemicals used in fracking. Slowly, by November 2018, we began to see improvement, and by April of last year, he was able to eat simple meals like his favorite, a ham and cheese sandwich, and play in the spring soccer season. He never received an official diagnosis confirming that exposure to fracking chem chemicals caused his illness, but treating it that way was the only thing that helped him. I couldn't take my son's pain away all those months ago, but I can protect him now by showing up here today. 
This is why I suffer the brutality of this process, to share my family's story, to lay our experience and illness bare splayed out before strangers in cruel exposure, because it's important that you know this is happening. I have been in the room as other mothers testified to the health and safety impacts they and their families have endured. We have stepped into this considerable regulatory gap, shared our stories, and now hold you, the COGCC, to a standard of science, compassion, and human kindness. I know you're not discussing setbacks today, but neighborhood drilling is not safe. This activity must be kept away from people's homes. I'm also asking you to make sure that the new rules you adopt are ironclad and fully enforced so that it, it, is, it isn't easy for companies to get exceptions or variances. I understand you're not addressing variances until later, but impacted residents often don't have the expertise to question arguments by companies about why certain rules shouldn't apply and may not even understand the significance of a company's variance request in time to do anything about it. We rely on the commission to follow through and fully apply your new regulations. In the weeks and months after my son was sick, as he was healing, I spoke with several different people at CDPHE in different capacities. I poured through COGCC records and attempted to recreate timelines of what was happening at fracking sites around my home. I taught myself how to use tools and websites like Frack Focus to compile at least partial lists of what chemicals had been used, and then took those lists to different people at the CDPHG and people I know in the industry to ask if any of these chemicals might have been what caused my son's symptoms. Trying to find answers for my son has been a frustrating process to say the least. My engagement with the COGCC, inspectors, and others was never met with support. Instead, I felt scrutinized, questioned, and frankly dismissed. Mostly, I received answers like, there are no studies saying whether this chemical or that one would make someone sick and what that illness would look like. I understand now how broken the system must be that I, a mom with a sick kid, was piecing all of this together alone at my dining room table. I think there should have been an investigation before drilling was even allowed to consider what the combined impacts of all this drilling would be for the people living nearby and what risks the commission was exposing us to. And after drilling started, someone with knowledge of the process should have been requiring continuous monitoring of air quality and building a timeline and seriously investigating complaints. Having a sick kiddo is all consuming and dark and isolating Every bit of my energy for months on end was spent desperately trying to find him relief and a path to effective treatment. I know of other families from Erie who have moved away, who have had our same experience with cyclical vomiting and constant nausea, but I don't know if there is a file at the state somewhere compiling our experiences, connecting the dots between fracking and the dire illnesses we are suffering in Erie and elsewhere. It's time for a glacial shift in the priorities of the commission expedited by truly embracing the intent of Senate Bill 181, shifting power to impacted residents and responsibility for harm to the industry. Imagine if the health risks and other neighborhood impacts were fully addressed before drilling starts rather than after people get sick. Imagine if my experience had been met by your commission with compassion instead of defensive anger if protocols were triggered and answers sought and information shared and illness acknowledged and treatment engaged, imagine my son would not have suffered for months and months on end. Impacted residents like me rely on you to establish and enforce strong rules and not to allow companies to seek variances from them. Hold the industry accountable and in doing so, protect us. We need to develop a framework to address and account for the cumulative impacts of current and new oil and gas development. The most recent health study released by the CDPHE is a good start. It recognizes that there are indeed negative health impacts from living near oil and gas operations, but we need more data. And we need it now, not years down the road after hundreds or thousands of new wells have been drilled near homes. We need a series of state-sponsored health studies looking at the impacts of living near oil and gas operations that address questions like, what does prolonged exposure look like? What about the magnitude of exposure for folks living near these multi-well super pads? We need to look at different densities of VOCs and how specific topography in an area concentrates them 
and our exposure. These studies need to be comprehensive and actionable so that as data is coming in, we can understand and make swift changes to protect people and end the dangerous practice of neighborhood fracking. End it. My family's experience points to a broken system and the importance of building a comprehensive framework that addresses and accounts for the cumulative impacts of current and new oil and gas operations. So that when a seven-year-old presents with serious unexplained illness, we don't waste critical months of suffering trying to find answers and treatment and relief. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Baer, for your testimony. And commissioners, thank you for, for listening. And that's all of our affirmative presentation. We're, um, we're available to answer any questions you have now. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. I uh, appreciate the panel's testimony. Um, at this time, we will move to commissioner questions. Um, commissioners, if you have a question, let me know and I, we can. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, thank you for the testimony. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I again understood um, Mr. Freeman, what uh, kind of what your ask was uh, regarding cumulative impacts. And so my understanding is, and bear with me here as I'm going through a couple of different screens, is that your concern uh, that the Form 2A uh, submittal requirements do not include um, a requirement to provide a, a cumulative impacts plan. Are, are you are you worried that the, it is a uh, it's not a, sh a shall but rather a may? Is that what your concern is? Because as I look at the 2A submittal requirements, I do see there is a there is a uh, uh, section in there that would require that plan to be um, provided. Are you looking at 304 C19, Commissioner? Yeah, and so that's the cumulative impacts plan. Right. Uh, so it does indicate that that plan would address the cumulative impacts to resources identified pursuant to Rule 303 A5. 303 A5 um, is the 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 in information provided in the cumulative impacts data evaluator, evaluation repository. Right, and what I, let me pull up the rule, what the end of 304 C19 says is um, that the cumulative impacts plan uh, will be uh, provided if required by the commission director um, right, that's my ask. So are you yeah. saying that you would prefer it to be a shall versus a may? Or I guess I'm trying yes, to understand that's, that's, what your concern there is. Yes, I think it should be, at a minimum, it should be a shall, absolutely. It should be a standard part of the um, of the Form 2A application um, for the reasons we described. The other point that we have proposed in our, um, uh, in our proposed language is that, we, like some of the other parties have asked for, we'd like to see the analysis done by the commission, not by the operator. And the reason for that is um, uh, it will provide, you know, an, an analysis that's done, um, providing the information that the commission staff wants in the format they want, um, rather than having a different analysis prepared by different operators um, with different levels of rigor, um, uh, and, and substance, and, and we, our proposal is that uh, the commission can use its new fee authority under one SB 181 um, to charge a fee for the standard permit application that will allow uh, the commission to retain a, an outside contractor to do the analysis on an ongoing regular basis. Um, so the commission gets the information in, in the most efficient, uh, useful way possible. But but yes, a key, the, the key part of our ask is that um, the permit specific cumulative impacts plan be a part of, of every, be, be a part of every uh, form 2A. Okay, thank you.
Chairman Robert Robbins, you're muted. So I am, so I was. Uh, other commissioner questions for this panel? Um, Mr. Van Woodenberg, um, I had a question for you. Um, the sites that you noted near your home, um, were those sites uh, within, and, and, and I know you spoke to this a bit, but if you just clarify, I think that some of those sites were not within Erie, but they still were close to your home. Is that right? Correct. The Kite Peel or the Kite Trails Pad um, is about three quarters of a mile to the east of me, and it is 200 feet outside of the town of Erie. Um, yet, Erie residents were very disproportionately affected by the impacts of noise, odor, and air quality. And so, um, I don't know if you've been following the evidence and testimony, but uh, there are certain local governments that desire the commission to, in its permitting process, allow proximate local governments, so one that's nearby, to weigh in on the COGCC permitting process. And then there are some local governments that don't desire the COGCC to allow proximate local governments to weigh in on a location near their border. Do you have a perspective having been an impacted resident of Colorado on that point? Yes, very much so. And especially, it's interesting because in Erie, we're on both sides of it, um, that we had no standing to provide input um, or to object to the siting of the Coyote Trails Pad in unincorporated Weld County. But for the same token, um, when negotiating an operator agreement with Crestone Peak Resources, um, we tentatively allowed for the ACME site, um, which is 530 feet away from the nearest home, but also very close to uh, a large number of impacted residents in Broomfield. So I would very much support the notion of um, proximal government participation in any siting application where there's a municipal boundary within something like 2,000 feet. Thank you. Are there other questions for this panel from commissioners? Commissioner McGowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I think if I'm hearing your testimony um, uh, in the right way, you're also suggesting that um, the plugging and abandonment of wells be considered in the cumulative impact. And when when you bring that up, are you saying um, wells that are only actively being plugged and abandoned, or um, any historic? That so in your in your map that you were showing, some of those um, wells are not active; they've been plugged or abandoned. Is that would that be part of a cumulative analysis also, or just active? Um, active activity, I don't know how to say it, but. So for, as an impacted resident, it all matters that um, the drilling and completion operations are the most impactful, but plugging and abandonment is just as much of an invasive operation to residents living nearby. But I think what we also need to consider is the, the cumulative risk of leaks and fires and explosions um, while a well is in production, um, as well as issues like we saw with the Davis well in Anthem, where a well had been improperly plugged and abandoned, and then we saw explosive levels of methane in the soils there last May and caused a tremendous amount of upset in a neighborhood full of new homes and folks trying to establish their lives um, when that well had to be dug up and properly replugged in order to make it safe. So pipelines and gathering lines and flow lines and maintenance operations and venting and flaring, all of these things um, occur for years and years and years once you drill a well. And, and that is the, the true cumulative impact of hundreds of wells in the municipal boundaries of Erie. And as Ms. Baer um, testified that there are tens of thousands of wells all in Weld County um, that, that really speak to that regional cumulative impact. Any follow up, Commissioner McGowan? A slightly different trend. I'm wondering if either of you knew 
before you bought your house when you moved in that there would be that much activity in your neighborhood if if you were informed if that had been shared with you um i'm just this is just from i'm just curious i feel like we have a lot of folks in these situations where you you know they didn't have an idea of um what was going to happen in their neighborhoods and how we again create, create more kind of meaningful community engagement and knowledge around what's happening in someone's neighborhood so I, I've been a resident in this home for 13 years and when I moved in um, you know a, a, as a part of the contract for purchasing my home there's a standard disclaimer about oil and gas exploration and that um, we were not mineral owners that those rights had been severed and that we were only uh, mere surface dwellers um, but really, what I think what it speaks to is that uh, purchasing our home happened, you know, in, in 2007, really before the popularization and the advent of what we now call hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. Um, that the, the scale of the operations we're seeing are completely different than the romantic notion that some of us have of a single pump jack operating in the distance. That's, that to me, when I purchased my home, was the extent of oil and gas development. And to see this massive industrial operation, um, no one had ever seen that before. And it was like a, a very, very stark difference from my common understanding of oil and gas exploration to what I experienced at the, the Pratt Waste Connections and Coyote Trail sites. Um, I had a similar experience I don't remember signing a waiver or anything and buying the house but um when our realtor was showing us homes in Erie um you know we would drive around and pass the tan colored sites and um they weren't as Christian said they weren't like these massive huge things they kind of faded into the background and easy easy to overlook them and then when we were getting serious about buying this home our realtor did mention that there was a site, Waste Connections, that they tried to drill, but I believe, I believe it was actually Pratt that they tried to drill, or they drilled one well and it didn't go well, and so they sort of left that. And so it was my understanding that that was an abandoned project. And this was my introduction to oil and gas development in neighborhoods. I don't have any experience, so I didn't know to look further. I didn't know that the COGC seek existed <clears throat> excuse me um so we kind of left it at that we knew that there was a site um that we could see sort of on the other side of the golf course um that was abandoned and that was i didn't know to look for permits or applications or anything like that so we just thought it was done and um, we bought our home in 2016 and it was the within six months they started they put up the big two-story curtains and started um, drilling Pratt and Waste Connections. And so that's how I found out about it. Thank you, Ms. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Wittenberg. Um, Mr. Freeman, uh, thanks for that. Oh, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you mentioned a, an operator agreement that Erie had entered into with Crestone Peak Resources. And I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about that, what the contents were, what, what, what the intent was of that, what's working, what's not working, um, and if there was any kind of cumulative impact or um, alternative location analysis that was a part of that agreement. How many hours do you have, sir? Um... I think what it boils down to, as being as brief as I possibly can, is that um, at the time, pre-SB 181, when the town of Erie was negotiating the operator agreement with Crestone Peak Resources, that we didn't have any sticks, only carrots. So the concessions that we were able to get out of the Crestone operator agreement were really insignificant um, in terms of the operator going above and beyond the regulations um, stipulated at the COGCC. So really what happened there in um, like the town negotiated the agreement um, with the major concession of removing one pad at Vessels Minerals and doubling down on the Acme site that had previously been slated for 15 wells and is now um, pending with a form to a application uh, up to 30 wells. So 
really it, it was a, a point where the town of Erie was negotiating from a strength of incredible or from a position of incredible weakness and really didn't have anything to to hold Crestone Peak resources accountable to much of anything beyond what the COGCC already required. Um, so the, the only thing we were able to offer them was to make it easier for them to drill. So that included things like administrative approval of their application on a site-by-site -site basis, as opposed to conducting public hearings. Again, greasing the rails to make things more smooth um, for the operator. Um, and it, it had incredible, like it, it was a difficult time because the operator agreement actually, was actually executed in a four to three vote in the week before the election, um, when a number of initiatives were on the ballot. Um, and, and it was really that um, Crestone Peak Resources forced the town's hand into agreeing to something that really didn't improve the town's position um, and did nothing to fundamentally address the issues of noise, odor, and air quality that we as impacted residents experienced at Pratt and Waste Connections. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for your testimony today. Um, I also, I, most of the questions that I had, my colleagues have asked, um, but I did want to just get some clarification. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Van Wootenberg, um, the Pratt well, did you say that was in place when you moved in or when, or that was already in production? And how far away was that from the residences? So, um, no, the, the Pratt wells were drilled after I moved in. Um, I purchased my home in 2007. The first Pratt well was drilled in 2014. The remaining five wells were drilled in 2017. Um, what does exist behind the Pratt site, about 100 feet north, um, are some of those legacy vertical wells that uh, I spoke about earlier. Okay. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And then you had also mentioned, um, uh, one of the other commissioners had asked about the, the Coyote Trail site and how that is outside of the, the jurisdiction. Um, so I believe you said, I just wanted to clarify, so it was within 200 feet of the town boundary of Erie, um, so outside of the jurisdiction, 200 feet outside of, I should say, um, but three quarters of a mile outside of the neighborhood, is that correct? No, it's three quarters of a mile um, to the northeast of me. It's okay. about 1,200 feet outside of the neighborhood of Vista Ridge, um, and that like also 1,200 feet from the nearest homes. Okay. Okay, thank you. I wanted to better understand those distances. And, and you mentioned that those were um, locations where you um, were feeling the impacts of the noise, light, um, just the activities in general? Or could yes, you comment? Yes, very much. Um, Vista Ridge and, and the, this southeastern corner of Erie has a very unique topology. Um, not only by the varied landscape, but also the presence of two large landfills. Um, so in particular for noise, uh, caused very strange phenomena where I was able to um, ride my bicycle around the neighborhood and take a noise measurement in one area at 65 decibels on the DVC scale, and then move 200 feet away where the, the landscape terrain was different and actually get a higher reading in the 70s, um, which from a physics standpoint doesn't make much sense, um, but that the, the sound was reflected down the corridors of the golf course and from the, um, the elevations of the landfills and, and that kind of a thing. So it's a, it's a very unique topology um, on the surface and also from the matters of odor that um, pools of VOCs would stagnate inside the sound walls and then a waft of air would come and blow those VOCs over the neighborhood. Residents would <laughs> smell the incredible um, diesel and petroleum smells from the Gibson DA22 drilling mud. And when a, a field operator would, or a field inspector would come the next day to investigate a complaint, wouldn't smell anything. And, and that's just because of that, that very 
confined and temporal nature of the, the nuisance of odor. Um, it, it's a very difficult topic. Thank you, I appreciate those clarifications. All right, commissioners, um, do we have any further questions? Looking around and seeing none, uh, I believe we wanna thank this panel again for your testimony and your presentation. Uh, we thank you for your oral testimony today, as well as the pre-filed written testimony, which we've read and the pre-hearing statements and some of the legal arguments in those as well. So thank you again. Uh, we'll let this panel go. Uh, it is 10.52. Um, let's uh, reconvene at 11.05 um, and take our morning break. Thank you. Uh, all right, um, looks like we have our commissioners back. Uh, Ms. Larson, um, are you gonna, whoops. Yeah. Um, the next group is Western Resource Advocates. Is that that right? is correct, yes. And they have, let me just double check, uh, they've requested 13 minutes for this presentation. All righty. And are you going to let them into the house here? Yes, indeed. Good morning, Ms. Walker. Um, so we got other folks joining us. Great. Everyone should be in. Ms. Walker, do you have your group in? Uh, I've got Ms. Telling Husen. I'm sorry for the butchering of the name, Ms. Yes. Bennett. Yes, we're all here, thank you. So, thank you commissioners and director and staff of COGCC and witnesses. Um, I found the testimony very moving and informative. Uh, w, I'm Jora Walker with Western Resource Advocates. We have two witnesses. Our first, Stacy Tellinghusen, will address our proposed climate action rule. And then Kyla Bennett will address our cumulative impacts evaluation rule. The commission has asked for specifics, and I just remind the commission that we've submitted very specific red lines, and that hopefully, if all goes well, as our witnesses are testifying, I will also bring up that specific language that we've proposed in the context of the most recent version of the 300 series. Good morning, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Stacy Tellinghusen. I'm a senior climate policy analyst for Western Resource Advocates. I will discuss today why the COGCC must address climate change as part of the 300 series rulemaking um, how WRA's proposed climate action rule would work in practice, um, and why this rule is consistent with other state efforts. Senate Bill 181 charges the Commission with regulating oil and gas to protect, avoid, and minimize adverse impacts to public health and the environment. It is undisputed that methane contributes to climate change and therefore adversely impacts public health and the environment. In the last few weeks, we've seen blackouts in California due to the west-wide heat wave and fires raging across the west, including Colorado, with day after day of air quality health alerts in this state. It is clear from climate science that we have roughly 10 years to significantly reduce emissions in order to limit warming to one and a half to two degrees Celsius. Addressing methane emissions from oil and gas development is absolutely essential to achieving Colorado's climate goals and minimizing the adverse health 
and environmental impacts of climate change. In addition, I'd add it's well established that fugitive emissions from oil and gas include numerous pollutants. So managing methane limits the impacts of climate change and reduces hazardous air pollutants with attendant local benefits on public health and the environment. The Colorado legislature made clear that climate change is a threat to public health and the environment. House Bill 1261 passed also in 2019 Establish a science-based emission reduction goals for Colorado, under which we will do our part to limit warming and minimize the impact of climate change. Based on subsequent analyses by CDPHE, it is clear that the administration expects that meeting those emission goals will require a total state effort, including deep reductions in the oil and gas sector. Given these factors under Senate Bill 181, I believe it's incumbent on the commission to regulate oil and gas, including in permitting new oil and gas development to minimize the industry's impact on climate. The COGCC director indicated that she has full authority to address climate pollution in this rulemaking. In the 900 series statement of basis, the commission proposes to regulate venting and flaring exactly because the methane emitted contributes to climate change. It's also clear the commission must act now. API noted in its testimony that a well may operate for 30 to 50 years. Thus, any decisions made now will affect our ability to reduce emissions and meet our climate goals for decades to come. As I'll describe, WRA's proposal would enable COGCC to regulate impacts of the oil and gas sector on climate in an effective and transparent way. Finally, I'll just note that both the AQCC and COGCC have the authority to minimize the adverse impacts of the oil and gas industry on climate and I believe they should do so in a collaborative way. The AQCC will continue to um, promulgate emission control requirements on the industry, but the COGCC is really well suited to evaluate permit applications and determine if the projected fugitive emissions are consistent with Colorado's overarching climate goals. If the COGCC does not consider climate pollution in the permitting process, and we realize only after operations have been permitted that fugitive emissions are higher than target levels, we would then face the much more difficult task of clawing back some of those emissions from existing oil and gas sources. I'll briefly describe the three main components of WRA's proposed climate rules. First, the rules require operators to quantify emissions associated with their oil and gas development plan, consistent with the way those emissions would ultimately be reported to the AQCC. The director may review those projections to ensure they're accurate and may consult with CDPHE. Second, the COGCC must determine whether the projected emissions are consistent with the state's overall emission reduction goals. We recommended that the commission rely on the state of Colorado's greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap, which will be finalized this fall to determine the specific sector goals. To determine consistency, the director would then compare these goals to the sum of emissions from the most recently reported greenhouse gas inventory data, any newly approved operations, and the permit application. Again, the COGCC may confer with CDPHE on this analysis. And then the third component of our rule, um, that under that component, the director would publish an annual report summarizing the emissions, as well as any eligible technologies or actions that operators can use to reduce emissions. This part's important. It provides operators, you know, kind of with an, a budget and an idea of what they should be planning towards in subsequent permit applications. I think there's key advantages to the approach we laid out in this rule. Um, perhaps most importantly, it really firmly embeds an analysis of greenhouse gas emissions upfront in the permitting process. To ignore greenhouse gas emissions in permitting when climate change is one of, if not the most pressing public health issue, would create an unacceptable gap in the permitting process. Equally important, I think this proposed rule creates a strong incentive for operators to think creatively about ways to reduce emissions associated with their permit application. Testimony yesterday described the tactics that Noble used to reduce emissions in its Mustang development by over 90%. Um, Noble adopted strategies such as plugging older, less productive um, existing wells, electrifying infrastructure, and transporting fluids through lines. Um, that is exactly the type of innovative thinking that I think this rule can catalyze. Um, rather than prescribing a particular set of controls, this allows operators to identify the strategies or the, or the controls that work best in a particular development. Finally, I want to emphasize, I think this rule is really complementary to any rules that the AQCC develops to address greenhouse gas emissions. 
Colorado's goals are ambitious and they're science-based. Um, we know that we will need to make deep transformative changes in every sector of the economy in order to achieve them. We know, also know that the administration expects that we need to make deep emission reductions in the oil and gas sector, as well as other sectors. Um, I'll note the state has already established a cooperative agency process between the Public Utilities Commission and the AQCC to address emissions from the power sector. We think it makes sense to have a similar parallel process to address emissions from the oil and gas industry as well. Finally, industry representatives argue that this rule would be onerous or time consuming. On the contrary, WRA's proposed rules create a straightforward process to address and incorporate greenhouse gas emissions into the COGCC's permitting process. It's grounded in the science and analyses that underlie the state's greenhouse gas roadmap. Moreover, failing to address emissions upfront and subsequently addressing the emissions of existing wells or addressing the impacts of climate change is far more onerous. We will not get a second chance to preserve a livable climate. Quite frankly, we have to bat a thousand with our climate policies over the next 10 years. I think the COGCC has a critical opportunity and a duty to establish those guiding principles and policies in this rulemaking. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Walker, um, who's next? Um, that's me, Kyla Bennett from Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. Thank you so much for this opportunity to address such a crucial issue before the Commission. I have decades of experience in evaluating and addressing cumulative impacts, and WRA asked me to testify as to how the Commission can adopt rules that first evaluate and second address potential cumulative impacts while carrying out its mission. Adequate rules will ensure that the Commission fully understands the cumulative impacts associated with an oil and gas development proposal, and also ensure that these cumulative impacts are avoided and minimized, such that SB 181 public health and environmental values are protected. Importantly, evaluating and addressing cumulative impacts also keeps the public informed and allows the public to respond and contribute data and analyses used in decision making and explains to the public how and why decisions are made. In other words, it provides transparency and I think we heard very powerful testimony earlier about how that's needed. My testimony will focus on one, what it takes to evaluate cumulative impacts and two, how to address these cumulative impacts. First, proposed rule 305A5 is an important step in collecting necessary information to evaluate cumulative impacts. The rule requires operators to submit information on the incremental impacts of its planned project and also acknowledges the Commission's expertise in evaluating these cumulative impacts. However, simply collecting this information is not enough. Looking at incremental impacts of a proposed project misses critical aspects of a cumulative impacts analysis. The proposed rules do not require that an evaluation of cumulative impacts include either an understanding of the baseline or existing conditions of the resources, or how those resources will continue to be impacted into the future. Here's an illustration. An approved oil and gas development will affect public health and the environment for decades. To understand how such a project will cumulatively affect, for example, something like a riparian corridor, the commission must consider the existing or baseline condition of that corridor, the added incremental impacts of the proposed operations and the impacts of all other projects likely to have an adverse effect on the same riparian corridor. Without a requirement that this information be collected for every project, the commission will not know the cumulative impacts of the project under review. Therefore, the commission cannot make sound scientific decisions or carry out its mission to protect SB 181 values by assessing, avoiding, and minimizing cumulative impacts. Second, I agree with SB 181 that cumulative impacts can be the most important impacts to identify and address. Impacts from each project individually, if viewed in a vacuum, may not appear that impactful, but collectively, cumulative impacts may seriously harm public health and the environment. For example, destroying wildlife habitat or a stream system. In my experience, Sound decision-making necessitates a defined process that assesses and incorporates measures 
to avoid and minimize cumulative impacts. The current rules do not require this. For example, the Commission recognizes the, its alternative location analysis as one of the most important tools it has to avoid and minimize impacts. Yet the rules do not ensure that an ALA address cumulative impacts in looking for the best location. Similarly, the Commission recognizes that imposing conditions on a development plan is another important tool. Yet the rules do not provide a process that ensures that these conditions of approval include measures necessary to address and therefore avoid and minimize cumulative impacts. Without a well-defined process to address these cumulative impacts, these tools will not be effective. As a result, the Commission will be impeded in its effort to fulfill its mission. The current draft rules allow the director to request the operator to submit a cumulative impact plan. In my experience, this is not the same thing as a transparent process that informs decision makers and the public on the cumulative impacts of a proposed project. This provision of the draft rule also does not ensure that cumulative impacts are actually avoided and minimized. In summary, SB 181 promises that Colorado residents and their environment will be protected from adverse effects, including cumulative effects of oil and gas development. To meet this promise, commission rules must ensure that cumulative impacts will be evaluated and that evaluation of these cumulative impacts will inform project-specific decision-making on avoidance and minimization of these impacts, such that public health and the environment will be protected. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Walker, did you, your panel have any further presentation? No, thank you. Great. Um, all right. Uh, we will turn to commissioners for questions for the Western Resource Advocate Panel. Commissioner McGowan. Thank you. Um, thanks for everyone's testimony today and being here. Um, I, I can say personally that I've been grappling with trying to figure out how to align um, cumulative impacts, so the, the evaluate and then address um, and then marrying it with the work that's happening over at the Air Quality Control Division um, and the AQCC, sorry, the Air Quality Control Commission, um, and meeting the, the overall statewide goals for some emission requirements. Um, I'm very interested in this concept. Um, trying to figure out you know, the chicken and egg kind of situation where I know that um, there's been some modeling done on what the oil and gas um, activities are responsible for as far as um, their share of emissions and then what we need to see for reductions to meet some of these statewide goals and then how does how does the COGCC fit into that and work with industry to help meet those goals and from a high from a high level perspective this all sounds well and good I'm trying to figure out what the mechanics of that look like and wonder if you all have Thought, gone those extra couple of steps and thought about what the mechanics of that look like. How, how do we, um, so, you know, if, if industry is responsible for, I'm making up numbers, 25% of greenhouse gases in Colorado, and we're trying to get to an X number of reduction, then are we looking for X reduction in their permit applications? Like, how does, how do we put all these pieces together? I like the concept. I think we should be working collaboratively with the Air Quality Control Commission. You know, it doesn't make sense for us to be working in silos, but I'm also trying to figure out how to marry these concepts and put them together in a workable manner. Uh, Commissioner McGowan, thank you for your question. I'll, I'll do my best to answer it. I think, um, you know, I, I think we agree, you know, in terms of what the um, oil and gas sectors of emissions should be in that trajectory. I think we um, had kind of recommended to date that that the COGCC look at the sector specific emissions trajectory that's in that greenhouse gas roadmap, which will be finalized, I think, in late September or early October. And there are, are some specific sector specific numbers um, in some of the technical spreadsheets underlying that analysis. I think an alternative would be you know, if those numbers are updated by CDPHC as 
um, you know, part of a, a broader rulemaking, there may be alternative numbers that you could rely on in terms of what the overall industry's goals are. And then I think um, what, what we laid out in our rule was to, to try and address this practical question of like, how do we actually figure out what the oil and gas industry's emissions are and how do we make sure they're consistent with these goals? And I think there will be good reported data under the AQCC's um, Regulation 22, which was adopted this summer, um, that will be of existing operating wells. So I think the COGCC would look at that and then would look at any emissions projections from recently permitted developments. So any, any developments really that were permitted in the last like two or three years that are not yet emitting and reporting to AQCC. Um, and, and presumably that data would be in those oil and gas development uh, permit applications. Um, and then the third piece would be, you know, looking at the application that was before you and what the projected emissions are from that particular application. So those are kind of the, the three pieces that I think the commission would need to look at and compare those emissions and that trajectory of emissions with the, the CDPHE, you know, kind of roadmap trajectory. Um, you know, I will say that the, the emissions projections that, that CDPH is looking at are really deep in the oil and gas sector. So something on the order of at least 50% reductions by 2030. I think some of the recent data we saw was even, even deeper reductions than that from current levels. Um, so I, I do think that this is something that's really important to consider kind of upfront in the permitting process. I, I hope that answered your question. Commissioner Nanjapa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, and I appreciate uh, the question that uh, Commissioner McGowan was just asking. That was um, something that I'm also kind of noodling with. And one thing that came up yesterday when we were talking with industry um, was more related to the comprehensive area plans. And if there are ways to potentially incentivize um, you know, removal of old um, uh, lines and, and sources of, of potential emissions and how that can relate to um, the overall sort of cumulative benefit and reduce the, the impact. Um, wondered if you heard that testimony or if you had any thoughts on, on that as one way to um, achieve, you know, our emissions goals. So Unfortunately, I was not able to hear the testimony yesterday. I, I do understand that that is, um, or, or was, I, I believe, one of the components in the Mustang development, among others. You know, I think we are sort of um, technology agnostic on what the strategies and the actions are that are used to reduce a development plan's uh, emissions. Um, I think that, that leaving it kind of open allows the, the industry to come up with creative solutions and figure out ways to reduce emissions. I absolutely think that addressing emissions from existing wells should be an eligible action. Yeah, we listed some, a series of potentially eligible actions in our proposed rule. I think there may be others that come forward, but I do think that addressing those emissions from existing facilities that you know maybe are no longer useful um, could be a, a good action and a good way to kind of address broadly the industry's fugitive emissions. I'll, I'll defer to Joro, who I think did hear all of yesterday's testimony on that. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right. So, so the testimony yesterday reflected what was in the pre-file testimony of industry and uh, Stacy did review that information and that was what informed her testimony today. Um, but exactly right. Um, you know, one of the purposes of our rule, hopefully, is to encourage uh, proponents of particular projects to find ways to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions as part of the application process. And so that idea that those, um, that if we keep an eye on the degree to which we're meeting these climate targets, that that um, efforts can become more and more important in meeting those targets um, in addition to things that are occurring uh, uh, at the AQCC level. Because as Stacy explained, this is going to have to be, it, it's, a, it's a heavy lift and uh, COGCC has an important role to play in it. And our rule 
complements what AQCC is doing in a way that allows COGCC to use its expertise and its sort of big, big picture understanding of oil and gas development in a way that no other agency is going to have and uh, bring that to bear, complement on other efforts across the state and meet those targets. Thank you very much. Commissioner Messner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for that testimony. Um, certainly cumulative impacts is an important topic here. Um, I wonder if Commissioner Putnam would uh, chime in here a little bit. I guess I'm curious as to what your thoughts are, uh, Commissioner, regarding what would be included in um, the information that may be provided by CDPHE in a consultation as far as a referral to uh, an oil and gas development plan application and whether some of this information that's being um, considered, you know, by these folks uh, around cumulative impacts to climate might be a part of the CDPHE referral consultation versus something that needed to be inherent within this particular um, uh, set of series. But I, I'm just curious on thoughts there. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Messner. And it's, it's a great set of questions. You know, I think part of what we're trying to do very um, consistent with um, what Ms. Tonyusen laid out is really try to figure out how to make these work together. So as part of the consultation process already, we flag um, you know, best practices for not venting or flaring, make sure that you have, making sure that you have pipelines to take products so you don't have to vent, a lot of which we're gonna pick up in subsequent series. Um, but really pushing for the electrification of the sector, um, pushing for instrument air, um, rather than using the gas for instrumentation, um, electric drilling rigs, you know, those are pieces that we regularly flag. I would expect that we'll continue that um, and also tie it more closely to the proposed targets um, related to greenhouse gases, as well as the um, reductions that we're going to need for uh, ozone purposes as well here in the Denver North Front Range area. So just a kind of note on timing, which makes all of this, I think, more complicated. Um, as Ms. Tellinghausen pointed out, um, we will be coming out with a full draft of the roadmap um, next month. Um, we've proposed to a subcommittee of the AQCC to establish particular targets um, for sectors, including the oil and gas sector. Um, the first time that the full commission, Air Commission, will have a chance to address that will be in October. And then we're providing a 30 day period for the public um, to comment on that roadmap. So it probably will be finalized in the Thanksgiving to early December timeframe under kind of current um, expectations. So I think part of the challenge is it's hard to align with something that the commission, the Air Commission hasn't done yet um, and that we're recommending that they do. So I think one of the things that we'll need to sort through in the um, uh, discussion that we'll have um, on this series is just um, how to sort out the sequence um, of these issues. Somebody referred to as a chicken and egg problem. You know, I, I think there's a lot of interesting um, ideas and uh, a lot of interesting thoughts in the WRA proposal, um, but they're ones that we need to just figure out how to sequence with what we're doing here at the Oil and Gas Commission along with the um, the Air Commission. I'll also notice note that, as we noted for um, all of you last week, one of the things that we're proposing um, at the Air Pollution Control Division and the Air Quality Control Commission is an intensive stakeholder process starting probably in October when we're done here and Air Commission's done with its significant rulemaking um, later next month to really focus on a lot of these questions. And it may be possible that we can integrate some of that stakeholder work. So we're thinking jointly about COGCC and AQCC rules at the same time. 
Great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for this panel from commissioners? Okay, seeing none, um, thank you um, for your presentations and for your slides and for your written testimony and for your red lines. You've given us a lot to think about and we appreciate your attention to these important topics. Uh, Ms. Larson, we will send these panelists off into the ether and bring on our next panel. And you appear to be muted, Ms. Larson. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Commerce City and Mr. Sura is uh, participating, uh, representing Commerce City. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that? All right. Um, Thank you. My name is Matt Sir. I'm one of the attorneys of record for Commerce City. I'm speaking today because Dominic Martinelli, Martin City, uh, the Commerce City planner, is hiking in the wilderness for a week. And he claims, promises, that there's absolutely no possibility of internet connection. So you're with me. Uh, I will uh, make this brief. Um, and certainly Dominic Martinelli is going to be available later on in the, the mission change rulemaking. Uh, I'm qualified to give Dominic's presentation because I worked with Commerce City staff for over 18 months to negotiate a regional operator agreement between Commerce City and Extraction Oil and Gas. The regional operator agreement was finalized in September of last year and established eight proposed locations that still need city and Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission approval. My lane was in negotiating and drafting the regional operator agreement and over 30 pages of best management practices. But in truth, None of the mission, mitigation measures proposed were as important as finding suitable locations through our alternative location analysis. The city learned a lot of lessons throughout the negotiation and alternative location analysis process that Commerce City wanted to share. The alternative location analysis started by first conducting an assessment of the overall area where the operator had obtained mineral rights and where they planned to conduct oil and gas development. In this case, it was the entire northern portion of Commerce City. The city evaluated the scale of the development in conjunction with the city's adopted comprehensive plan, transportation plan, economic development strategic plan, future land use map, as well as other planning documents. At the time, before Senate Bill 181, Commerce City did not have the confidence that it could use uh, zoning uh, to control oil and gas development. Nonetheless, through the use of these mapping tools, Commerce City was able to find proposed locations that were more productive, protective of current and future land uses and provided the greatest public health, safety, welfare, and environmental protections. The city and operator met and over time understood the criteria each needed for a surface location. You'll note that the criteria listed on this list that the city developed are different but complementary to the criteria proposed by the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. They include a site's conformance with zoning and city's comprehensive plans, the absence of significant land use impacts, adequate surface acreage for safe and efficient operations, ability to access targeted minerals with technology available at the time of development, ability to reasonably implement BMPs, including and especially pipelines from the proposed location, uh, ability to consolidate and reconfigure proposed drilling and spacing unit applications to provide fewer and more suitable surface use locations, greater distances from existing residential development and future residential development, consideration of future commercial centers and corridors, proximity to floodplains, water features, public water supply wells, outdoor activity areas, open space, and commercial and public facilities. All of these categories were ranked and when combined, created what Dominic calls a heat map. Here's the rating criteria uh, and we were able to give different ratings and different weights to some of these different criteria, depending on what staff uh, thought were the most important. To continue, uh, this is existing residential areas. And so what you see in red uh, are those areas that are really off limits, uh, according to the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission's 500 foot setback. But we went out uh, to 1500 feet to try to find those locations that were farthest away from homes. 
future residential analysis was also considered because Commerce City, as all the cities are on the front range, is a growing municipality and wanted to provide those areas and ensure that they weren't industrial in nature, but they remained residential. We also looked at those industrial areas and actually targeted those industrial areas and weighted them in a way where uh, those areas would come up and, and be considered um, more accessible for oil and gas. We also looked at uh, high occupancy building units at that time, uh, the schools, frankly, um, and future school locations were important as well. We also looked at future commercial areas. Certainly, Commerce City cares about its existing commercial centers, but also recognizes that its tax base long term depends on future commercial and wanted to make sure that those areas were protected as well. So we put it all together and you come up with the heat map. Now this heat map is really illustrative of, of the discussions that we were having. And you can see here that the green areas are those areas that are, are better for oil and gas development. The yellow areas are, are less um, good or, or areas that we would, would want to avoid. And the red areas are areas that should absolutely be avoided. And for the most part, we were able to find locations that were uh, in green areas or in light yellow. So the goal of the city staff was to find proposed locations that were most protective of public health, safety, welfare, and the environment. At this early stage, we were not only able to look at different locations, but different drilling and spacing unit configurations. This is four different drilling and spacing unit configurations, recognizing that extraction has uh, mineral rights to all of uh, Northern Commerce City. How could those mineral rights be extracted in a way that was going to be least harmful to the residents and future residents of Commerce City? And this is the final result. The operator is now proposing eight locations that have been through the alternative location analysis by the city. In certain circumstances where it was possible to consolidate facilities, relocate facilities to more productive locations, or eliminate locations, these recommendations were made and ultimately led to a number of sites that were relocated or modified. With any alternative location analysis process, that should be the objective, to assess the operator's goals, consider their initial proposal, and then determine if better and more protective locations exist to access the targeted mineral resources. So the takeaways the city has is, the city learned through this process that the review of such an analysis should occur prior to the operator submitting an actual permit application. By conducting this exercise very early, it helped inform the operator's plans for laying out drilling and spacing units with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and negotiations on surface use agreements with landowners. The operator was also able to conduct a robust objective analysis process and had no reason to skew the results to provide justification for their planned facility at the preferred location. In terms of comments on the rulemaking proposal, Commerce City believes that proposing a number of locations will require an operator to make a good faith effort to find alternatives. And finally, some approval criteria is needed to provide transparency and clarity for the operator to show how their analysis will be reviewed and what will be deemed as acceptable. In closing, Commerce City feels that the Colorado and Gas Conservation Commission's draft is an excellent start, but should require uh, include the requirement for consideration of a minimum number of locations and review criteria. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Sura, for that uh, presentation. Um, I guess I can start out real quick. Um, that sort of looked, acted, and filled a lot like sort of a comprehensive area plan um, approach to looking at these sorts of things. Would you, do you have comments about that? Yes, to me too. And in fact, um, you know, it's interesting listening to the industry and their concerns about the fact that there's not enough um, of an emphasis on, on comprehensive area plans. I believe that those are gonna be really mandated at the local level. Um, and I think that they're the only way to really plan for oil and gas development going into the future, particularly on the front range, because they're going to have to have certainly gas lines, but, but oil pipelines as well. 
uh, to, to meet some of the air quality standards. And so recognizing that they have to provide for that infrastructure requires them to look at more than one location at a time. And I think that this is a perfect example of um, a comprehensive area plan. And uh, I don't know that the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission staff would want to have been involved for that whole 18 months. Um, but certainly, I think that there could have been a greater role for uh, COGC staff to play uh, in that, that process. Um, and maybe it would have gone faster. Thank you for those comments. Uh, commissioners, do uh, we have further questions for Mr. Sura? Ms. Commissioner Messner, and then Commissioner Nanjaba. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, and this is just a comment too. So, I mean, to me, um, that process, that heat map, that analysis, the alternative location analysis is also a great example of you know, how a local government can provide substantially equivalent information um, that may be able to meet some of the requirements of uh, what is being contemplated in the draft rules 300 series for alternative location analysis. And I'm not saying, we, we certainly didn't go into the details as far as what exactly was involved with all of that, but I think that does show an example where to me at least on the surface that looks like substantially equivalent information that may you know, really help uh, create some efficiencies as far as a concurrent review process with a local government uh, for alternative location analysis and ultimately siting of uh, oil and gas um, operations, you know, within a jurisdiction. So uh, I thought that was a great example. I agree. And what Commerce City was able to do is, is not only bring in all most of the, the issues that have been identified by the most recent Colorado and Gas Conservation Commission draft of alternative location analysis, but also what was most important uh, to that city uh, in looking at their comprehensive plan, the future uh, plans for Commerce City were able to be incorporated into that land use uh, planning. And I think that, you know, that is the model going forward. Commissioner Nanjapa, did you have a question? And then it looks like Commissioner Putnam has done something unique, which is he's raised his hand in the corner. I've not seen that yet. Uh, I, I really just, just my comment, it was more of a comment and it was very similar to what uh, Commissioner Messner just mentioned. I just, I thought that was a, a very thoughtful approach that you took and it does really, as Commissioner uh, Robbins said as well, uh, Chairman Robbins, that, um, it, it sounds a lot like a comprehensive area plan. And I think that makes um, the, the process that you undertook makes some sense. Um, and I think it gives us some good food for thought in terms of um, you know, how those processes work. But one thing that I, I did actually, as I'm talking, I'm, I'm just realizing I do have a question. Um, there, one thing I may have missed is, is did you, um, I know you mentioned transportation and I think it was a uh, residential housing plans, et cetera, that were taken into account. Were there other stakeholders that were brought in um, beyond kind of on that sort of planning level? Yeah, so um, certainly there was an open process um, at some point, but in the early discussions, uh, it was something that was more or less um, closed door because we wanted to have the ability to just roll up our sleeves and 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 talk frankly about you know the needs of the industry and and the needs of the city and future land use plans and didn't want to unnecessarily um, you know put forward a, a number of recommendations or or you know certainly didn't want their proposal uh, to be put forward publicly until it had been fully vetted. So I think that there is a need to to have you know this alternative location analysis occur um, somewhat privately. So um, it doesn't also influence their negotiations with surface use agreements. Um, that's, you know, that's a difficulty that we learned about, you know, through our negotiations with the industry. And I think that it makes sense that we want to, to again, give them the benefit of truly trying to problem solve rather than having to try to 
convince us that their pref preferred location or where they have a surface use agreement is really the best location. Thank you. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And, and especially from that perspective of, of you know, incentivizing um, undertaking this type of process. So thank you. Yeah. Mr. Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Sura. I was also interested just to follow up in your experience with Commerce City um, during that negotiation and the role that um, discussions around electric utility um, played. Certainly electrification of some of these are um, critical elements to reducing emissions. And we heard from, uh, I think, Mr. Calvert of Noble about the role that is, a cap can play in that process. And curious kind of how that unfolded in Commerce City. I think you're that much of that area is in United Powers um, territory and they take a somewhat different approach than Excel Energy does. So just kind of curious, um, you know, how that worked in ways that we can um, fold some of that into the cap or other processes. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Putnam. Uh, yes, it was a, an important consideration and really when I, as I mentioned in one of the, uh, the issues that we were looking at, one of the criteria was uh, incorporation or able, the ability to incorporate some best management practices and, and mitigation requirements of the regional operator agreement and electrification of these locations was one of them. And so early on, uh, extraction had to be in, involved in discussions uh, with United in a number of fronts. Um, it wasn't only to ensure electrification for those locations that were chosen, but also some of the best corridors for oil pipelines, gas pipelines, were those electrical corridors. And so, the, you know, really ha had to bring those, um, those folks in early on in this discussion. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that, you know, that, you know, a lot of progress was made um, in talking to some other operators, you know, they are sometimes um, feel that their interest in, in being able to access uh, electrical um, utility is hampered by just the sheer volume of other um, requests out there. Uh, and you know, maybe that's something that needs, frankly, some legislative fix to, to ensure that you know, those um, more polluting facilities kind of get bumped up in priority so they can uh, make sure that we get those folks electrified. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Thank you. Other questions for this witness, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sura, I was curious about the, the alternative location analysis that Commerce City has engaged in, and if Commerce City has come across any instances with operators where an alternative location didn't exist? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, you know, this alternative location analysis was merely to put forward the proposals. Uh, it was not to, you know, they still have to go through both the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission plan, as well as a city council, city of Commerce City uh, approval. And, you know, that, it is still an ongoing process and I, I can't even judge, you know, what might come of either of those. Um, but what I can say is that we were tasked with the goal of giving them access to all their mineral rights uh, within Commerce City. And we came up with the best possible uh, solution for that based on the existing land uses and, and all those criteria that I mentioned. Um, and it was a it was a long exhaustive process, you know. At the end of the day, um, either the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission or the City Council might determine that, you know, the best location wasn't good enough. Um, and you know, I, I think that um, you know that that remains to be seen. Uh, there are some locations that you know we tried to get as far away from possible uh, to to residents, uh, there is one location that is uh, just over a thousand feet. Most are, are far more than that, but um, there is one location that, you know, is, you know, was closer than, than the, the city staff um, wanted to see it, but it was the best location we could find. Great. Commissioner Putnam, your hand is still raised. Is that from previously or did you raise it again? 
that's from previously. So need to work on my Zoom skills. All right. Um, seeing no more questions, Mr. Sir, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Ms. Larson, we have climate reality now, is that right? That is correct. And they have uh, 13 minutes for their presentation. And Ms. Jan Rose will be presenting. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Ms. Rose. Terrific. Um, thank you so much, commissioners. My name is Jan Rose. I'm the party representative for Climate Reality Denver Boulder Chapter. Um, and my talk today will be focused on my relationship as the legislation and regulations chair for this all volunteer chapter. Um, and the experience I've had both with the legislature and the passing of bills over the last three years, as well as being a party to rulemakings at the PUC, the CDPHE, and the COGCC. So I have a good overall perspective of the approaches we're taking to meet Governor Polis's intent to make us a 100% renewable energy state by 2040. Um, so uh, I want to address some of the larger factors that should go into the determination of cumulative impacts disproportionately impacted communities and alternative location analysis and provide some data. I know this is a frequently discussed topic here the last couple of days, but um, the data I will supply is different and I hope that you will factor this information in. So let me begin screen sharing. So I'd like to begin with giving you an overview of where we stand as a planet and as a state as it relates to the climate crisis. And uh, climate change is accelerating rapidly. We last year hit a, an extraordinarily in, um, important tipping point in the Arctic, which if you have interest, I can discuss uh, later. Um, but Colorado's temperature has ridden risen 2.5 degrees over the last 50 years and a reminder that the difference between ice and water or between snow and rain is the difference between 32 degrees and 33 degrees. So 2.5 degrees centigrade, I mean Fahrenheit, is not an inconsequential number and the planet as a whole is at 1.3 degrees increased temperature rate, which basically means we have lost our opportunity to keep the planet at 1.5 degrees, uh, and we are losing our chance to keep it at two degrees. And the, most of the climate scientists I talk to these days are looking towards a 3.5 degrees centigrade uh, limit, and that is catastrophic to human life and to plant and animal life as well. Um, so if you look at this chart, what you can see is the impact of that over the last 50 years. Before the Industrial Revolution, we actually had more cold years than warm. And beginning in the 30s and 40s, when mechanization and, and internal combustion engines came to Colorado, we began to have more warmer days. And you'll notice that as we move forward in time, the colder days get less cold, or the colder years get less cold, and the warmer years get more warm. The last 20 years have been the 20 hottest years in the history of recordings and in the last 800,000 years of our planet, showing no signs of slowing down. Uh, heat wave days in Colorado are expected to jump from 10 per year now to nearly 50 per year by 2050. I am amused by this slide because we have had 30 heat wave days characterized as three days in a row above 90 degrees in just this past month. We literally haven't been below 90 degrees since early July. Um, so 50, 50 days per year is actually now rather than 2050. Um, and of course that's reflected on snowpack. We have a number of snow monitors throughout the, um, the state that we use to measure snowpack in April. And in April our snowpack has declined by 90% um, of of Colorado's monitoring sites and that affects one of our most lucrative tourism and revenue intake the 28 billion dollar a year ski industry. Um, all 64 Colorado counties have had a federally declared weather disaster since 2010 um, and uh, the Pine Gulch fire and the Grizzly Creek fire uh, are going to expand that those numbers of weather disasters. 
Um, so we have to take a look at the cost of climate change to the state because the cost is in the tens and tens of billions of dollars. And we have these historic weather events like the bomb cyclone of last year that happened not once but twice in a 30 day period, unprecedented. And of course, the damage it did to the Midwest in the snow melt was an incalculable loss to our country. Uh, Boulder County did a study at the end of 2013 after the floods of 2013, which was a $13 billion disaster. Uh, and estimated that just Boulder County will spend as much as $150 million over the next 20 years to mitigate the effects of weather disasters in Boulder County. We've also had the single largest species extinction event ever recorded, and that was the loss of 3.4 million acres of pine forest in the, uh, in the high country. Um, and that is because it never got cold enough to kill off the beetle larvae, and so we had two seasons in one year of them being able to voraciously eat our trees. That has resulted, amongst other things, in a 30 times increased number of acreage. Uh, the Pine Gulch fire is now our second largest fire, and that took it less than three weeks to uh, reach number two status because we are in the midst of a 20-year drought and growing. Uh, our fire season is more than three months longer, and that affects the state of Colorado in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And we're in the midst of a 20-year drought that is only being exacerbated. And you can see the projected uh, soil mo moisture loss, which really hits the southern part of the state and our farmers. So it's important to know that at the current rate of groundwater depletion, 35% of our agricultural industry will be unable to support irrigation in the next 30 years. This is important because 88% of our water goes to our ag community. And fracking a single well takes millions of gallons of fresh water, very little of it which can ever be returned to the water supply. Uh, so we're diverting water for non-beneficial uses. Um, let's take a look at the fossil fuel situation in order to keep the planet at less than two degrees. In the, in the history before fracking, we had about uh, uh, 2,000 gigatons of CO2 that we could burn, and we burned almost 80 gigatons of that in the last 20 years alone. Now, because of fracking, we have almost three gigatons of available fossil fuel reserves, but we cannot burn it. We've got a $22 trillion cost to not burning that in order to keep the, lim the in increase uh, limited to two degrees centigrade. Uh, so this is where the term keep it in the ground comes from. Um, now, um, the markets are addressing this through a number of sources, oil, of gas is, oil and gas is a peak, or, or a piece of that. BNP Paribas, who, which is a European uh, oil giant, um, has already concluded that industrial combustion engine cars are dying and that we are in a relentless and irreversible decline of those as wind and solar power EVs are now becoming the standard. The powertrains will equal out in the next two years and so it will be just as inexpensive to own an electric vehicle as it is to own an ICE car. Um, we've also converted our power sector so that uh, in 2014, a mere six years ago, we were only 1% of the world. By last year, we were two thirds of the world. And in the next five years, we will have put, uh, created an electricity sector that powers the entire world. Colorado is a classic example of that. We replaced the Comanche coal-fired power plant in um, Pueblo with a solar plus battery um, option. And the price for that came in at 2.1 cents a kilowatt hour, whereas a typical liquid natural gas power plant would come in at more than five cents a kilowatt hour plus the monthly cost of fuel. So it's already cheaper to build wind and solar than it is to build LNG and that reduces the need for traditional fossil fuel products. In addition, the whole world is, and the state of Colorado is moving towards um, increasing building energy efficiency because that's around 20% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the state of Colorado has introduced a residential plan to do that and passed it this year. And next year has a plan for um, rapid electrification of commercial buildings um, that we expect to be introduced at the legislature. Uh, climate change is a medical emergency, but our other, um, our other presenters have covered that well enough, I think, that I don't need to go into details on that. I do want to point out that there is um, an, a cost that 
that may not be visible to the eye, but it is certainly visible to the infrared cameras. And this is a classic case of looking at Northridge High School in Greeley through a regular pair of eyes and looking at it through an infrared camera. Um, additionally, I want to start dovetailing in with other agencies. And so the CDPHE has a health equities panel that they're going to be approaching later on this year that has a number of factors over and above um, the uh, census tract and block criteria being used by the COGCC for determination of disproportionately impacted communities. And these are some of the areas that, that, uh, that they are factoring in to determine disproportionately impacted communities. Um, it's interesting that Commerce City went right before me because Climate Reality would argue that the single most disproportionately impacted community in the state is Commerce City for a number of historical and present purposes. And there's your aerial view of the Suncor refinery, which refines the dirtiest oil on the planet, Canadian tar sands oil. And that should be a factor in whether there is additional development in Commerce City. Um, we also want to point out that it's not just wells that uh, cause um, pollution and health problems. Compressor stations, midstream plants, processing plants, etc. Um, also help contribute to our overall greenhouse gas inventory. So let's take a look at what the CDP is looking at in terms of reducing greenhouse gases. You saw an HB 1261 presentation uh, last week, I believe. Um, and here is the current, um, well, the, the inventory from 2005 that we have to reduce by 26% in five years and 50% in the next um, 10 years. And you'll see that oil and gas takes up 19% of that overall emissions management that we have to begin to control. That's where we're looking at mission change to start to make us um, uh, on, um, you know, a serious dent in that problem. Uh, this is related to water diversion that we can't afford to, to convert over to oil and gas. And then finally, we also have to look beyond uh, standard greenhouse gases and the CDPHE has been addressing this in various rulemakings. Um, so we need to look at high, uh, HFCs, which the CDPHE has begun to, re re has begun to regulate, um, perfluorocarbons, which we um, need to address more, um, more successfully. And sulfur hexafluoride is a huge uh, issue because it is the single most Im um, impactful greenhouse gas and it is used to insulate um, electrical substations which might be used for things like the must the Mustang um, um, Comprehensive Area Plan. Sulfur hexafluoride is 23,000 times more heat trapping than uh, carbon. So uh, a single kilo of that can have a huge uh, impact on that. So I just want to take your uh, quick attention to the areas in which we can um, reduce emissions. And of course, some of that is in uh, transmission and in distribution in addition to processing and the actual install. Here's a slide showing the amount of energy we produced and the amount of, of vented and flared um, that we can control, the amount of gas. And as you can see, of the 221 million metric tons of gas, we're currently venting about 4,200 million metric tons. Um, eliminating that will not make a big enough dent in our oil and gas plants. Um, so this is the kind of thing the CDPHE is looking at as an example of how we're going to get to 50% reduction in the next 30 years. We have to remove 90% of our emissions from the electric sector, and we're well on our way to that. Um, we need to actually convert 66% of our automobiles from ICE to electric vehicles, which is a really significant goal. Um, we need to electrify um, homes and, and, and uh, commercial buildings to eliminate LNG hookups. And finally, we need to curb oil and gas extraction and production to 20% of its current levels. Um, so the yellow line shows you where we are right now in meeting our goals for 2030 uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions and the red, it's is where we need to be and that large area is where we're hoping oil and gas will fit in 
this is the um, this is the sample diagram from the CDPHE as to how much emissions reductions we need from the oil and gas sector. You can see they've assumed seven million metric tons already this year. I don't know if that's if that's um, if that's going to turn out to be actual. And then you can see those additional reductions occurring over the next 10 years that indicate that we not only have to do something about emissions, we need to do something about additional permitting of new emissions going into the atmosphere. Uh, and Ms. thank Rose? you, I'm sorry for my time. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rose. Um, do commissioners have questions? That was a lot of information. Um, Commissioner Putnam has raised his hand. <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you, Ms. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Rose. Um, definitely um, intrigued and agreed with uh, a lot of what was in there. I did want to make one um, clarifying point about this slide that you've got up right now. Um, this refers to a sensitivity analysis on possible effects of COVID on production and not necessarily our kind of main planning scenario. Um, I think our main planning scenario is closer to 20 million metric tons for this year. Also assumed growth, which we're probably not going to see as a result of what's happening in the economy. Um, but just wanted to make clear that um, this one's probably lower than what we're planning on right now is more of a sensitivity to understand how COVID could affect things um, earlier this year. I don't think it changes your bigger point, though, that we need deeper reductions from the sector. Thank you, Commissioner Putnam. Other questions? Uh, Ms. Rose, could you um, stop sharing your screen? Sure. Thanks. Then I can see everybody. Uh, other questions for Ms. Rose? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Rose, thank you very much for the uh, large amount of information on the very important topic. Uh, we, we have all of that in our written testimony. You do, you do add yep. more, so you can certainly yep. refer to the testimony, but I will send a copy of the presentation uh, to the appropriate contacts as well. That, that sounds great. Uh, thank you again. Um, so we will at this time, um, uh, dismiss you from the panel. Um, commissioners, it is 1211 and we do have on our schedule a 45 minute break. Um, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I, I'm thinking that the, the next panel is Citizens for Healthy Community and they desire 22 and a half minutes. So it, in, in my mind, it makes sense. Let's make our, take our break now and then and let's, let's do the full 45 minutes. Uh, it'll allow not only us, but our stakeholders, the opportunity to pay attention to whatever else is happening in their lives. So um, why don't we uh, reconvene it at say, let's, let's say one o'clock. Does that work? Good, okay. And we can all just, um, hey, Ms. Larson, um, sorry, let me ask you a question. Um, should we get off of Zoom or stay on Zoom? What is our operating you, protocol? You can certainly stay on Zoom, that's fine. Okay. You can stay logged in and everything will just, we'll just put everything on pause. Okay, thank you. Sure.